getting a bit of a uh, feedback there. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I think that was my fault. <laughs> uh, well, hello. Uh, welcome to the 20th anniversary live stream for Haven for the Human Amoeba. Now I'm confused. Are we still getting feedback? Uh, hang on. Does anybody, if it, does anybody have the um, does anybody have the YouTube thing going as well? No. Yes. Sorry. I will sort this out. I will. I'm, I'm sure it's my fault again somehow. Uh, I can't hear anything wrong with it. Okay, let's see if the problem it, um, has sorted itself out. I've um, now added um, David. I've now added um, David J as well. Hi. Um, so yeah. Uh, well, hello. Welcome. Let's see if see if we get it, get it right this time. Welcome to the twentieth anniversary live stream for Haven for the Human Amoeba, the first major online ACE community. My name is Michael Dore from the Haven Project team, and I will be introducing this event for passing over to our host, Yasmin Benoit, and our special guests, David Jay, Lauren the Flute, and um, Samantha, who will be joining us in about half an hour. If you're following on YouTube, then um, live captions are available by pressing the cog on the bottom right and turning subtitles on. Um, there is also an external site given in the, um, there's also an external um, site given in the description where live captions will appear if that is more convenient. So thanks to Mike Text for providing these captions. Um, so let's start with some quick intros. I've already said that I'm Michael or Mick um, today. Uh, see if I can actually get a banner for myself. Um, yeah, and my involvement with the community started in 2009. And so Haven for the Human Amoeba is well before my time. So I'm looking forward to hearing and learning more. Um, that will do for me. Uh, over to you, Yasmin. Well, first I want to clarify, can everyone actually see me? Because looking at it, it looks like the live with StreamYard thing is directly in front of my face. So let me know if you can't actually <laughs> see me because I can't really see myself. First I want to clarify, can everyone actually see me? I'm also getting feedback now, which is weird. And I wasn't before. Um, but to introduce myself, so I'm Yasmin Bamwa, a model and an aromantic asexuality activist. And I was not one of those aces that kind of spent a lot of time on social media while I was discovering my identity. Yasmin Bamwa, a model and an aromantic asexuality activist. Feedback is really weird. Um, I only started using, um, obviously, I discovered Avon when I was a teenager, but aside from working out what asexuality was. I didn't really hang out on this site that much. So there's a lot about like the kind of online spaces that I've only really encountered within the last few years. So I'm definitely interested in hearing from people who were around literally when I was a kid, before I even knew how to use a computer about what the ACE community was like online and kind of get, have like a more like a newer perspective compared to those who were around for like that stick, like the early days. So I'm very interested in hearing um, everything that we have coming up in this event. Excellent. Um, okay, so um, DJ, let, let's have you next. Oh, I'm muted. Uh, my name is David J. I uh, first discovered um, the, uh, I'll, maybe I'll tell the story in more detail later, but I first discovered Haven for the Human Amoeba in the summer of 2001, um, a few months after I started uh, what became, what was called AVEN, but was not yet asexuality.org. It was still hanging out on kind of my personal web, college web space. Yasmin, I like how you're just peeking under the... <laughs> <laughs> um, I just love the comments uh, saying that they can't see me. 
Um, uh, I'm also really excited to revisit this period in history. Oh, uh, as we'll see, it was a time when a lot of questions that are, um, a lot of the ideas of the ACE community were already being talked about. Um, definitions, uh, romantic spectra and identity, um, gray and demisexuality were like all there in nascent ways. And so I'm excited to kind of dive back in, especially with some folks uh, like Lauren who were there for it as well. Thank you very much. Um, Lauren, next please. All right, um, I'm Lauren. I go by Lauren the Flute online. I My story is kind of the, the reverse of Yasmin. I think I joined Haven for the Human Amoeba in I think summer of 2002. Um, and stuck around for a few a few months, joined the early days of Avon um, and was kind of trying to find my place. Because um, as with many of us, I'd been, you know, struggling with trying to figure out where I belonged and who and what I was. Um, thought I'd found it. Um, and then due to some of the turmoil of the early history of the, I guess, the ACE community, I wound up leaving and not really returning until I think I, I dipped my toe back in briefly in 2014 or 2015 and then kind of ran away again. So um, for me, learning kind of about the the current activism and the the not the history but I guess the present of the of the movement of the the community has been really, really exciting. And so I'm looking forward to um, after this, um, after this presentation, continuing to hopefully remain part of the community this time around and kind of see what people are doing now um, and maybe find my place in the asexual community as it stands today. So thank you so much for having me here. Awesome. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, we do have one more special guest, Samantha, who will be joining us in about um, 30 or it might now be 20 minutes. Um, and so Samantha will introduce um, when when she's on. Uh, so I think we're all good now. Um, sorry about that rather amusing and stressful um, hiccup at the start. Um, I, I think we've got rid of all unwanted interference. Uh, so let's let's crack on ahead. So, um, yeah, thank you. Um, apart from the five of us um, who are actually on camera, there's actually a long list of names who've worked to put this event together behind the scenes. It's involved a lot of research um, through the archives, so I'm very grateful for that. So thank you, everybody listed here. Um, next, next slide, please. So a bit of background um, before I hand you over to um, Yasmin and our guests. Haven for the Human Amoeba was a Yahoo email list um, that started at 17.33 Pacific time on 11th of October 2000, um, or um, 33 minutes past midnight UTC Zulu on the 12th of October. So the date it was founded depends on time zones. In the Americas, it will be founded on the 11th of October, and in um, Europe, Africa, Asia, and Oceania, it was the 12th of October. And so next slide, please. Here is what the group looked like circa 2002. So at the bottom, you can gauge some idea of the activity levels. Next slide, please. The idea of celebrating the 11th of, or 12th of, celebrating either the 11th or 12th of October as the anniversary of Haven for the Human Amoeba is actually quite an old one. So the Asexual Visibility and Education Day, or AVED for short, was proposed in 2006. Um, for the 12th of October, because of the anniversary of Haven for the Human Amoeba. But it wasn't so much a history event, it was more a visibility or education awareness day. So I think it's fair to say that AVED kind of fell by the wayside as a visibility and education celebration, being overtaken by Asexual Awareness Week, now known as ACE Week, and other annual events within the ACE community. So we're really actually kind of proposing a rebrand of 12th of October as ACE History Day. So I mentioned already, it could be kind of either 11th or 12th of October. So we're going with 11th of, 11th of October today for the live stream because it's a Sunday. But in general, Ace History Day, um, we're going to go for the 12th of October um, because uh, a few reasons. First of all, um, just, first of all, to make it coincide with the old AVED event, which was the 12th of October, and also 11th of October is also National Coming Out Day. Uh, Okay, um, so what is Ace History Day? Well, we're proposing it as a chance to share any interesting facts or tidbits you find about Ace History, not just about Haven for the Human Amoeba. 
any ace history, whether relatively recent or old or even, you know, ancient mentions of asexuality, anything at all that um, you, you, you find interesting, I've, it would be great to share this on social media on 12th of October. Um, we even have a uh, hashtag, uh, which I will display, but... Yeah, there we go, ace history. Um, I would also like to shout out that um, Ace Week are following are also following a history theme this year because it's the twenty it's the tenth anniversary of um, Ace Week, formerly known as Asexual Awareness Week. Next slide, please. Okay, but today um, we're concentrating on the um, anniversary of Haven for the Human Amoeba. So what this event will comprise is, first of all, I'll be giving you some background about um, the founding of Haven for the Human Amoeba and a bit of the context at the time, a sort of lightning tour, if you like. Um, then I'll be handing over to Yasmin, who, with our guests, will be exploring some themes that emerge in the Haven for the Hum Human Amoeba archives. We expect the live stream discussion to last around one and a half to two hours, after which um, there'll be a chance for small group discussions on air meet. There's a link in the um, it, it's not active yet, but there's a link in the description below, and we, we will say more about that at the end of our live stream. Um, we will be trying to monitor the comments throughout the live stream, and so questions are welcome. We'll get to those if and when we can. Um, and there's a contact address if you um, would like any feedback. Okay, so I'm just going to give a lot. So this is not going to be a comprehensive ace history by any means. Um, I'm, there, there are better, there are much better references for that. Um, in fact, we're not even going to be comprehensive about Haven for the Human Amoeba because there were thousands of posts there. Um, but let's just give a very, very quick recap here. So what is Haven for the Human Amoeba? Haven for the Human Amoeba was a Yahoo Groups email list founded by um, DRK Sparkle on the 11th or 12th of October 2000. The archives are no longer publicly available, um, though we hope to make, um, we're going to share some excerpts today, um, and we hope to make um, maybe some more of the highlights available in due course. Haven for the Human Amoeba is generally considered to be the first major online ace community. For just a, as a comparison, the um, AVEN, the Asexual Visibility and Education Network, was founded on the 10th of March. 2001 and the forums so that, that's a good five months after the foundation of um haven for the human amoeba and the avon forums were even later the, tw the 9th, 29th or 30th of may 2002 and just also for comparison the asexual life journal group which was another major um play major place for organizing in the early asexual community was founded in april 2002. however arguably Haven for the Human Amoeba was not the very first online ace community. Next slide, please. So on the 38th of May, 1997, Zoe O'Reilly posted an article called My Life as an Amoeba. And um, there was an extended comment section of this article, which is argued by some, for example, Nat Tipman, to be the very first online ace community. Perhaps it should be called really more of a proto community. Um, so the next slide shows a picture of or a screenshot of the, the, the article and um ne and next the comment section please so this is just uh, no yeah well there we go um so you know a lot of people posted here oh um, i'm really glad to have found this article um here's my story next slide please so like i say this is not in any way comprehensive in, in terms of ACE history. But um, if, you, if you're interested in the early history of the online ACE community, um, I've got a few sources here to recommend. So I recommend Nat Titman's first-hand um, account. Nat Titman was a leading activist um, in the first, they, they were the founder of the Live Journal community and they wrote the first FA, FAQ on Avon. And they did a talk um, in 2002, which they sort of extended and a, a more comprehensive write-up um, in 2017, so um, I, as well, worth checking out. We actually hope Nat might be able to join us later on, um, just um, to, to say hi towards the end of the live stream. Um, and uh, there's also a very good account in um, Andrew Hindleiter's um, dissertation. And I've also listed some other interesting resources. Um, there's a there's a there's a article on the um, Avon Wiki for Haven for the Human Amoeba, and there's a 
there's a talk in 2014, not so much about Haven, but about um, sort of ancient, modern and less modern ace history. Um, and there's also a, a blog post and um, a Wikipedia page, which I recommend checking out. Okay, uh, let's move on to Haven for the Human Amoeba then. So it's all here's how it all started. It all started with this one post by DRK Sparkle. And incidentally, we would love to be in contact, DRK Sparkle, if you're out there. So the very first message was just welcome to the Yahoo message board for Haven for the Human Amoeba um, back in October 2000. And so there was actually nothing happened for a while. Um, there was we had no there was no activity until um, almost four months later, um, in February two thousand and one. Um, then the DLK Sparkle, the same person, wrote, "Hello, I see there are members here, but I have this daunting feeling that I'm the only person here who could actually be considered asexual." <laughs> sure, we've all felt that before. Please, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Next, please. And then finally, about a week, well, a week later, um, there was a reply to that. And you can imagine how that must have felt. <laughs> so um, Capil says, this topic um, piqued my interest. I've been fairly happy without a physical relationship, though I do feel a need for love. I would rather have someone with whom I can trust and feel good about than just go for superficial thrill that most seem to be looking for. So uh, I think after that, there was a kind of trickle of posts. And interestingly, not, not too long afterwards, still quite early, only message 12, DRK Sparkle um, linked that, that very article, um, My Life as an Amoeba by Zoe O'Reilly. So this kind of suggests, it's, we don't know this for certain, but it sort of suggests that perhaps Haven for the Human Amoeba was named after that. Well, it got the Amoeba reference from that article, but that's speculation. We've never been able to confirm that. Yeah, at this point, I'm going to hand over to, actually, can we go back one, um, please? Um, but yeah, I'm going to hand over to Yasmin right here, um, who will... Um, take up and um, have an interesting discussion with the guests. Could we flip it? So I'm, there we go. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, that was actually really interesting to hear, especially, again, as somebody who definitely was not around for those early days. Um, and as someone who's been on kind of like the A social media scene more recently, I don't hear the amoeba comparison so often. I mean, you kind of hear it sometimes when people are trolling, but I haven't heard it as kind of like an embraced nickname so much recently. It definitely seemed like it was more prevalent back then. Is that something that um, you guys noticed? Did it kind of like fade out after a while? All right, go ahead, Lauren. Oh, no, I was just gonna say um, that you would probably have more sense of like things fading out. But um, I know back back in the day at this time, because um, I feel like these days, if somebody talks about the the amoeba thing, if you talk about asexuality, a lot of times either either they're joking or they're being mean. Um, but they are coming from a place of having heard the term asexuality before. Um, whereas um, in 2002, when I was first exploring this, um, people hadn't, like, by and large, people hadn't heard of asexuality. They didn't know it was a thing. So if you said that you were asexual, people would almost always, without exception, say, ha, oh, like an amoeba. Um, and it, it arose from this place of absolute ignorance because it wasn't known. And so it's interesting to me that now we are at a time where when somebody chooses to make the amoeba reference, it is, it is a choice they're making rather than kind of their default knee-jerk reaction to something that they've never heard before. So that's been kind of fascinating to see. Um, but I think uh, uh, David David J probably has more to say about the yeah. I, so I remember being that. in high school and searching for the word asexual a lot, and this was pre Google. Um, for those of you who remember that such a time existed, uh, so it was like Lycos and also Alta Vista and the other other early search engines, and you would always just get papers about amoebas and plants and things. So it was it was definitely an association in my mind, but it was sort of this. It was a reminder of invisibility to me, that word. And uh, I remember the first time I did a Google search, I had a friend who was went to school at Stanford and told me about Google and was like, there's this new search engine and it's really good. And I was like, yeah, search engines are horrible because they never show me the thing I want to find. And then they were like, no, you got to try Google. And so the first Google search I ever did was for asexual and it got me to Zoe's article. 
the, the Zoe O'Reilly article that was mentioned earlier. And that was a really big moment for me. Um, that was part of uh, the inspiration for me to, to put up Aben was finding that first article and just the intense like, feeling of validation I got from it. Um, and then uh, I remember seeing the, uh, I remember someone from Haven with Human Amoeba found Aben and reached out to me a few months later. And that, and seeing the name and kind of immediately getting like, yeah, of course, because Amoeba are all that we find um, when we look for one another. And it was, I'd say really, maybe kind of 2004, uh, as Avon began to take off and become the place where everyone was hanging out. Uh, and eventually, especially as we began to get press, we, the term amoeba really fell away because the term then just asexual, ace wasn't a thing yet, but the term asexual was really taking over and there was more, more of a sense of us finding one another. And in many ways, amoeba was a reflection of our inability to find one another. As if I remember, Oh, sorry. sorry. I was just gonna say when I was in school and I said I'm asexual, the thing everyone always said was, "Oh, like a flower." So I guess it's kind of reminiscent. It's like the same thing. It's just a different kind of thing that people just associate with like asexual reproduction. I'd always just get, "Oh, asexual, like a plant, like a flower." Um, although maybe that's maybe. I mean, if if you're in America, maybe it's like an education system thing. <laughs> maybe maybe you were taught more about bees and we were taught more about flowers. <laughs> aren't flowers flowers because they're not asexual? I, <laughs> I know everyone always it's do like, like a flower. Thing, but... They reproduce it themselves. I mean, technically, I guess they, I, they the can, pollen yeah. come from somewhere else. So do they? I don't know. But that's right. what people always said to me. Um, so I guess a contemporary version, you'd make a haven about the human flower. And that would be the the name of it. But sorry, what were you going to say, Lauren? I was, I was going to say, I remember, um, and this um, is in the archives somewhat, but I remember, I think when I was going through the archives, reading people talking about like, do we want to stick with the term asexuality? Because during the Haven for the Human Amoeba, um, there, because, you know, human amoeba doesn't necessarily have the word asexuality in it, there's kind of like, do we want to call ourselves non-sexual, anti-sexual, um, some other term like that. And I remember being so frustrated about the amoeba reaction that you would get from people that I was like, let's just go with non-sexual, please, because that sounds like what it is instead of having to explain it. This, the moment you say the term, you then have to say not like an amoeba, which was so commonly the reaction that you would always get from people who'd never heard the term before. But and I think that's not how that it actually works. leads on to the next slide. If we could go to the, um, the parts about when we were kind of coming up with the definition for asexuality back then, it said that one of the very first questions was kind of coming up with what asexual means. And can we go to the next slide after? Yeah, because someone says, could someone please explain what asexual is? And then the next slide says, um, simply means non-sexual. Um, so it's interesting that back then the definition is almost exactly the same as it is now. Um, and I like how specific they are about differentiating it from an attraction to horses, cats, or dogs. Um, so yeah, it's interesting that the definition has stayed quite consistent. Is that something that you've noticed? Do you feel like it has stayed pretty much the same the whole time? Lauren, go ahead and then. Honestly, honestly, I don't know that I have much to add on this just because um, uh, my my experience with with what counts as asexual, I think, is, is different than yours um, in the community. So go ahead. Oh, just that one big change, and this happened pretty early, is that this has a gender binary or, or explicitly references a gender binary. Um, and we moved away from that pretty early. Uh, I think that when I know when I not, not this is about human you mean, but not even, but um, when I put up uh, the original version of Avon, it said um, attracted to uh, a, a sexual is person is attracted to neither gender because I'd only heard of a gender binary. And then someone, one of the first emails I got was someone being like, by the way, you might want to include, not want to include a gender binary in that for this and this reason. I was like, oh yeah, right. I didn't think of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm new to this queer world and, and took it out. Um, but uh I mean, yeah, I, I feel like that's still quite forward thinking considering that this is like 
2001 because I feel like I didn't start hearing about terms like non-binary and about trans stuff until like after the 2010s I didn't really hear people talking about that so I feel like that was kind of before its time in terms of thinking about like non-binary identities because I feel like that wasn't really that much part of like national consciousness until kind of recently at least for someone who wasn't that in the queer scene a few years ago <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think I'm, we'll get to this later, but the, the ways that aceness, like early asexual discussion was interacting with notions of gender binary, uh, of, of a binary gender, I think are, are interesting. I would just ask if anybody is reading our posts or reads our posts in the future um, to bear in mind that this was almost 20 years ago. And a lot of us were younger people without access to Google and the wealth of information that's available today. So some of the language and the approach and the thought that we had were grounded in the experience we had. And it is interesting looking back and seeing how much queerness, for example, has evolved over the past 20 years. Definitely. I mean, I'm just surprised that there was not so much conversation going on in 2001. I wasn't even sure. I didn't even know the internet existed in 2001 because I didn't use it until I was a teenager. So it's fascinating to see that there was so much of an ace community already back when some of us were like learning to read. So um, could we go on to the other slides, please? Um, yeah, it's also interesting that there's that we were making the distinction between asexuality and celibacy already back then as well, that that was part of the conversation, as I can see from this comment. Um, and this one says, oh, I guess it's kind of, it's almost kind of bringing up the topic of like being kind of indifferent. I guess maybe that was like the beginning of people considering the different types of asexuality sort of or at least that's the first time we've seen that word pop up on this so far Can we are, 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 oh. are people here familiar with the term boston marriage no actually i don't know what that means <laughs> so I, I know we i know we want to keep going but um in the uh in the early 20th century there were a bunch of women who would be roommates until they found a husband uh, and many of them would just keep being roommates forever. And it, the term became a Boston marriage when there were two women who would live together. And they were in this interesting intersection between aceness and lesbian like identity, uh, where it's, it's difficult to know historically, but uh, that was one of the first discussions about asexuality was a book that was about Boston marriages. And so, when people like me went to university libraries early on, it was the only thing you could find <laughs> was this book about Boston marriages. So that's why it comes up here. So is that was that code for we're lesbians, but we're not going to say it? Or is that just being a roommate with a girl, which doesn't sound very uncommon by today's standards of having a roommate? So it was, so it was be <laughs> like somewhere between we're lesbians and we're not saying it and we are committed romantic or aero partners and not saying it. Like they were, they were, the the whole term Boston marriage came out of the fact that these were intentional, committed, very affectionate, like loving relationships. Uh, and the society at the time just couldn't process that there were two women who were doing this. Right. So it's not just like Rachel and Monica living together on Friends. It was kind of more than just having a right. roommate or single. It was like Rachel and Monica living together and deciding to not get married so they could keep living together. Oh, OK. Well, that sounds cute. <laughs> Can we go on to the next slide, please? Oh yeah, well, this is interesting again, cause like one thing that we kind of take for granted is actually just having the term asexual and having that be the widely agreed term. But it looks like back in 2001, people were kind of still at the phase of discussing what term should be like the main term. Um, this person says, how about unsexual? There's no negative connotation there. Antisexual seems harsh. Asexual is reserved for plants. Okay, so the plant thing was a thing. People do, <laughs> whether it's accurate or not, I guess people think of it for plants. Um, I've never, heard, what is this word? Unich? Unich? I don't even know. Unich is, it's, it's a, it's a, back in the day, they would, they would castrate men so they could ma maintain their soprano voices and things a long time I can't ago. Even pronounce the word. Um, how do you say it? Unich? Unich? Eunuch is how I'm used to it being said. Oh, like it also, it might be different on that side of the pond. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and there was also an interesting question of if you masturbate, does that make you unsexual? Or does that automatically place you with the gays, the bi's, or the straights? Um, so yeah, it, do you remember like the early conversations about kind of trying to work out what the best term was? Were you around when they settled on asexual or did they never really settle on anything? It just caught momentum. I think I think asexual had kind of caught momentum, but I, I just I remember having very strong opi opinions that I would have rather kept non-sexual because I like I said, I think earlier, I was very tired of the amoeba comments. I would get that every time I told anyone, um, sometimes because they were confused and sometimes because they thought they were being funny. Um, but I thought, you know, non-sexual tells you what it is. It's not sexual. Um, doesn't have a, a prior prior term, but um, obviously that's that's not the direction that the language went. <laughs> so, I I think part of it was determined by just what people were searching. Like the more people were looking for the term asexual than these other terms, and and part of it, I think to uh, uh, part part of why I liked it, or I wonder if this was the the kind of subtle psychology going on, is that even though asexual was a description of planet, it was a description of an innate state. Whereas non-sexual just meant like, there is a thing that doesn't involve sexuality right now in this moment. Like a relationship is non-sexual, um, but for a person to be non-sexual is just for them to not, like like it, it felt more it, temporary it and ephemeral. Yeah. Room, room for celibacy to be included under that. Yeah. Yeah, I know that, and that makes sense that I'm not necessarily saying that I as a young person with that idea had it fully like, like I think that I think that that makes a lot of sense. I don't think I understood that or had those conversations, just those thoughts. Um, but it but it was it was it definitely felt like it was something that was still being figured out at the time. Um, and that's I think interesting looking back from now to then and thinking about how kind of malleable and unformed things were as they were becoming formed. I like the thought that kind of like SEO is part of why um, asexuality got the name because that's the that's the term that people were using. That's what people were thinking of. I hadn't thought of that, but it makes sense. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm quite glad that we went for asexual in the end. So I feel like non-sexual would have definitely confused things, and it also would have led to any asexual person who has had sex or has sex or masturbates or is like in the gray area would technically not fit the description of non-sexual. So I can see how that could have like caused some issues down the line. Um, can we see the next slide, please? Uh, so I'm just going to cut in here. We um fight. We we now have um Samantha. So I'm going to bring Samantha on. Hello. Hello. Hi, Samantha. Good to see all you guys. Good to meet everybody, and good to see David again. <laughs> hey, good to see you. Could you introduce yourself to everybody, please? Sure. My name is Samantha. Um, I've been asexual since 1971 when I was born. Um. <laughs> um <laughs> I, I don't know how much you want me to say, but I discovered a, I discovered I wasn't the only one in 2002. Um, I would do annual internet searches for asexual people. And in 2002, I got a hit. And so I've been not a very active part, but I've been part of the community since then. So here I am. And I, I think back, I'm a romantic asexual. So um, I guess you guys will be talking about that later. So um, hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've definitely got some of your contributions to things coming up in this in this slide. We were just talking about the origins of the word asexual and how it seemed like back in the early 2000s, there was conversation about um, what phrase people should use. Should they use non-sexual and saying an anti-sexual oh, yeah. sounded negative? Did you have anything to add to that? Do you yeah. remember? Like, um, the choosing process? Oh, well, I was going to say, before I, before I, you know, learned i guess that asexual is an orientation in and of itself i just always like before i knew of the concept of asexuality i always told everybody that i have a high romance drive but zero libido that's how i worded it <laughs> um so i just that's, my my concept of asexuality was just people with zero libido i've since learned that that's not true but that's how i conceptualized it back then before i under you know before i learned about more about asexuality and it's interesting because that's pretty much the exact slide that we're on now. And I noticed that looking back at some of these, there was a, quite a bit of conversation back then about asexual people with libidos and kind of debating like how that fits into asexuality. And it's interesting because nowadays, I feel like when it comes to any kind of exclusionism, it tends not to be about libido. 
it tends to be more about like kind of gray area stuff rather yeah. than masturbate well, or whether or not you have a libido. And it seems like that's kind of like fallen out in terms of prevalence. Is that I something? Also, I was at a psychoanalysis conference years ago and they said that a person's sexual orientation is defined by the content of their fantasies. And I was like, well, then I mustn't have one because I've never had a fantasy. <laughs> I didn't tell people that, but I was thinking that's weird. You know, but now I realize, like, at least I've learned since then that if you're asexual and if you happen to, you know, self-pleasure, that, that, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, but if a person who's asexual who self-pleasures, they don't really fantasize about anything or anyone. Um, and that would make sense to me. But, um, you know, that, so, that, yeah, it's just interesting. Did anyone oh, else have to, to add about the whole um, libidoist exclusionism from back then compared to now? I, I can jump in. Just that th this was a really big, I remember this being a really big fight inside of uh, Haven for uh, inside of HHA about whether um, whether people who experienced sexual arousal could be included. And there were some people who really strongly believed in gatekeeping against anyone who experienced sexual arousal or sexual pleasure or masturbated, um, what we now call non-sexual pulsed aces. Um, and so there were these people who were all about kind of definitional purity and they created sites where there were, like there was a quiz, like the site opened with a quiz and you had to answer every question in the quiz the right way in order to like be officially asexual. Um, and uh, I was very much on the opposite camp. I was like, this is a term, it, need, it exists so that people can, uh, it's a tool to help people forget themselves out and we shouldn't be enforcing or gatekeeping who can identify as asexual. Uh, yeah, me, and, me and a bunch of other people were there who were on that side, but there was kind of a, there were these two sides around libidoism. Yeah, I mean, by the, by the standards of back then, I probably would have been in Lauren's boat and had to leave too, because I wouldn't have ticked the asexual box if, if people with libidos don't get to be part of that, because that's never been something for me. And I'm, see, I'm seeing some comments coming up about fantasies, and I do want to add, like, having a fantasy um, while masturbating does not necessarily mean that you're not asexual. I've noticed in my uh, research of these things and talking to other asexual people, the distinction tends to be not imagining things happening to yourself. And that tends to be the, uh, the distinction for a lot of asexual people. Like no one ever, they don't really want to put themselves in that situation. And the thought of being in that situation isn't appealing, but it doesn't necessarily mean you think of like absolute darkness <laughs> while you masturbate. Some people still need to think of something. Um, so yeah, that was just a comment on some of the comments that I'm seeing uh, coming in. But it's interesting how nowadays the um, conversation about libido is not quite as common. In fact, I see a lot of the time people always clarify that asexual people can still have sex, asexual people can still enjoy sex. And that's like one of the first clarifications that people say, which would have been quite different, I guess, to how people would have um, described asexuality back then. Which is interesting. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, and I guess this was the beginnings of people starting to discuss the distinction between um, sex and romance, and I guess sexual orientations and romantic orientations, um, which is interesting. Because um, this one says, what exactly is romance? Which I guess is a, is a, is a very aromantic question to ask. <laughs> That's something I have definitely um, wondered myself. And the distinction between that and an intense friendship. Um, and I guess this is kind of symptomatic of maybe the kind of aromantic community overlapping with the ace community in, in the sense of trying to find spaces back then. And maybe there were a lot of aromantic people who weren't actually asexual around who were kind of trying to find their own space? Was that something that you noticed at the time? Anybody? I wasn't a romantic, so I can't answer that. David, did, I think, do you have anything? I, oh, just, just, I remember when romantic aces first came up, I, because I'm a Aero, 
and my aero and in those early days, like my aroness and my aceness, I just conflated. And so it's like, what do you mean you can be romantic and not sexual? Like that's <laughs> that's craziness. Um, <laughs> and it like took me a while to wrap my head around it. And then I was like, okay, I like enough people are describing this experience. I believe okay. it. I accept it. I, I validate it. But, uh, my apologies for any posts that come up that are me being obnoxiously a row. No, no, it's funny because I have such a strong romance drive that it never occurred to me that somebody could be a row. So when I first <laughs> when I first got on the hate, you know, the the um, the listserv, the Yahoo group, um, I was like, I was happy to find other aces. But then once I found other aces, I thought I was the only ace on the planet that that was hetero romantic. <laughs> I was like, no, nope, I don't belong anywhere. <laughs> so you know. So it's just as as more, as more ace awareness emerges, then we're finding more and more varieties and types of aces, you know. Were there many people back then who were a row but not ace, but still found themselves in that same space just because they might have kind of conflated mm. the two at all, or was it distinctly very asexual and not very like a row but heterosexual? Having looked back over the um, the archives, it does appear that there were people kind of in all these different camps that we might put under the umbrella, but like kind of figuring out like, okay, you know, I don't want a relationship, but I'm not ace. Like, or, or, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't hate sexuality or, or find sexuality unappealing, but I don't find romance. Like that's not my drive. Um, and, and everything in between. Um, like it, it was, it was interesting to see all these people kind of coming together and trying to figure out, are we the same thing? And if, if some of us are this way and some of us are this way, does that mean we fit under the same umbrella? Does that invalidate some of us belonging in this group? It is interesting you see a lot of that um, looking through the archives, people not being sure where they belong because of where they fall on that. And it's very much the same thing nowadays. It's like if you were to hang out on Ava now, a lot of the conversation is, does this count? Am I included? Am I, do I fall under this or this? And people just kind of trying to work their orientations out. Um, and I also noticed, I really like the way um, you describe the difference between um, celibacy and asexuality. Um, when you said, namely, that celibacy implies a choice, whereas asexuality implies a state, I think that that is a good way to um, describe it. And it's also interesting that, considering this was like 20 years ago, people are still confusing celibacy with asexuality, like all this time onwards, like that has not changed in terms of like general awareness, interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, celibacy implies the resistance, the resistance of temptation to me, you know. I had a, I had my sister once tell me that she thought she was as ace as I was because she wasn't in a relationship. Uh, yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> and it's like, well, you might not be having sex, but that's not necessarily the same. It's not the same thing. It's like the difference between somebody who does not like chocolate versus me when I'm on a diet and I'm trying to avoid chocolate. It's like, you know, celibacy is like somebody who's trying to avoid sex or whatever, you know, like a priest or whatever, you know what I'm saying? It's like comparing someone who's like on a, like a lactose, like free diet and someone who's like lactose intolerant. It's like, well, actually, like there's like a reason why I'm not doing it. You're just kind of choosing not to yeah. not do it for the time being. Um, that's more of a choice. This is more of a state of being. Um, so I definitely like that phrasing. Um, could we go down a few slides, please? Yeah, and I also really like this person who, I guess, again, this is kind of like the early days of trying to find ways of like describing asexuality to people, which again, is what people still try and do nowadays. And I quite liked the comparison that they made here sexuality being a stereo, sex drive being the volume, and orientation being like the radio station, I guess. I like that um, comparison. I think that's quite a good one. That's quite a good way to describe things. To people, I haven't heard anyone use that one before. People should use that more often, I think. <laughs> Did you have anything like akin to that? Did you guys have like your own thing that you tried to like use to explain it to people? I mean, I remember the first time I saw the the triangle, which was the first time that it was like more than just the homosexual versus heterosexual <clears throat> and, and having the idea that there might be another dimension um, that that included ace people was was like this this revelation that I would not I don't think ever have thought of that myself. But I remember I remember thinking it was brilliant and that it would help me like having having someone else create the tool that I could use to then explain myself to other people was helpful. 
Yeah, it yeah. seems kind of like the early way of creating the distinction between things like, you know, sex drive and orientation and all those kind of things and understanding that like it isn't just like a kind of here here thing. It might be more of like a like a graph and people kind of fall into this part, but then they also connect to this part and just how it's a lot more complicated. I feel like the ace community has been quite good at like having more complex conversations about the different aspects of sexuality and it sounds like we've actually been having those conversations for a long time and we're just kind of repeating them now, um, which is interesting to me. I, I love reading the stereo theory. Sorry, I didn't do my homework. I'm just reading this now. Um, but what the reason why I love reading this is because back in the day, up until about 2013, I'd say, when I first met a bunch of aces, I had my own little theory, but about the difference between romance drive and sex drive, it was, I always called it my X and Y axis theory. Um, and it's, it's basically, it parallels all these other theories that I've seen in ACE community, in ACE forums. And I've talked basically where there's um, an orientation spectrum that, that the Kinsey, uh, you know, if you guys uh, know about the Kinseys, who they, they came up with that spectrum from gay to straight. It wasn't just a solid state gay or straight sort of thing. And so I always added my own Y axis to that, which was like, uh, you know, the the degree of sexuality from ace to gray to, um, you know, highly sexual. And I was always preaching that to everybody. And then, and then years later, I found out that other people came up with parallel theories in, in the ace community. I'm like, that's so cool. <laughs> you know. It is. And hello and goodbye to the child, which was just there and is just departed. Oh, that's, that's my daughter, Tavi. <laughs> oh, uh, David, you since, you, since you just answered that question, somebody else had commented to me and I didn't know how to respond. Hi. Yeah, this Aww. is a Hi. Hi. Who's the child? Cute. Hi. Everyone say hi to her. Oh, how cute. <laughs> okay, okay. Everyone go with mommy then. Oh, um, cute. All right. Um, he's, a, he's a cutie. <laughs> so, uh, I... I remember using this stereo theory um, when I was explaining it. Like, I found it really helpful. And one of the things, and it's it's subtle in here, was that this was uh, helpful in the kind of libido argument because there was a volume knob and a dial knob. So you could have one of the things that got talked about was you could have your volume knob turned up so it's audible, but it's on static. And that was a way of describing what it was like to be a like experience sexual arousal, but not experience sexual attraction. Okay. And, uh, and I also remember this was part of, you know, this was just one example. I don't know, I don't know how much this still happens, but in early HHA and in early AVEN, there were like people were constantly coming up with spectra. Like everyone was starting with the Kinsey scale, then like adding like, but there's another spectrum for gender and there's another spectrum for like, uh, levels of sexual desire. And there's another spectrum for like different kinds of kink, and there's another spectrum for like sapio sexual attract, like sapio attraction and romantic attraction <laughs> and physical attraction. Like people were coming up with these like massive hypercube models of sexuality just to try to create space to describe where they were, and it was this game that people would play, or like part of part of this very common part of the the journey of self discovery. Yeah, and I and I wasn't and I was totally listening, but there was also a kitten for a second, and I just wanted to like <laughs> draw attention. Like, I guess there's like comments of people, like there was a kitty, and I was just like, oh, a cat! I swear to God, I just like that. Um, and I love that. There's children, there's kittens. This is amazing. Um, can we can we go to the next slide or the next two slides actually? Oh, actually, um, David J, this is getting to your part. Um, not the, can we go to the next one about the um, member oh, yeah. intro? This was actually something that you posted. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Well, thank you. Uh, this was something that you posted back in 2002, which is pretty interesting. And personally, if someone was to dig up something I posted on the internet from 20 years ago, I'd be cringing so hard. But in your case, you were actually writing like decent stuff in 2002. Um, and you had kind of spoken about your story. And since that's here, do you want to like talk? Do you want to like read this one out? I feel like it would be more appropriate. <laughs> sure. I don't, I definitely am cringing a little bit, but I'll read it. <laughs> um, uh, long overdue, here's my asexual story. 
Um, I've been asexual for as long as I can remember. The statement is a good deal more complicated than it sounds. After all, children are, when compared to most adults, asexual as a rule. Wouldn't agree with that now, but. Um, there is a period for me, um, it was about fifth grade when sexuality, or at least its most fringe trappings, suddenly becomes fashionable. It's, it happens gradually. People begin to discuss crushes, a cumbersome social construct called dating flies in from the rafters, and suddenly, suddenly, subtly, you begin to understand that the scene around you has changed. Everyone else has begun to move. Something inside of them has begun to sputter and whir as they tenuously inch around this new environment, and here you are stuck in, a, stuck in neutral, undeveloped. This is one of the chief reasons why the majority of asexual people remain hidden in the sexual shadows of our culture. Also, wouldn't totally agree with that now, but it's lyrical. <laughs> it's interesting that you specify like um, fifth grade, which I'm gonna guess is around kind of the same as ours, which is around like kind of like 10 or 11. Yeah, that's yeah. when I had my first crush. <laughs> which is when I noticed the exact same thing where I was like, oh my God, something's changed. It was literally that age range. So I've always yeah. found like hearing your story interesting that we kind of specified the exact same, like noticing the same phenomenon at the same age, age group. Um, yeah, there's actually a part two to that story, if we could go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, as I said earlier, it wasn't until fifth grade that my world became really became a sexual one. I reacted along with my then asexual peers in a mix of confused excitement and disbelief. By the time I got to middle school, the excitement and disbelief had faded and the confusion was had developed um, its usual accompaniment of fear. I had no idea at this point what sexual attraction was only that it was um, unpredictable and potentially focused towards me. I was terrified that someone might be attracted to me. I avoided all contact with girls and my interactions with other boys were limited to non-sexual topics. Doubtless, I would have stayed that way if not for a lucky set of circumstances during my freshman year of high school. Um, my freshman class was female dominated as many are at that time. And my, in my freshman year, a sizable chunk of the social core of my grade, about four or five girls all came out. This was a godsend. Suddenly, I had a group of people who were not who are not going to be attracted to, uh, to people uh, who are not going, I think I meant are not attracted to me and who are not going to expect me to prove my masculinity by being attracted to others. I somehow managed to um, ingratiate myself, I think, with some of them. And in that friendship, I had my first space to discuss what was going on. I struggled with terms, ideas, and implications, eventually settling on the phonetically awkward term and sexual and not really knowing where to go from there. And sexual. And sexual? Is that, yeah. is that the... That was the, that, that was the first word I used. Because I didn't mean? want to use A because the plant thing. Oh, oh, interesting. So why, what is, what is an like? Um, an is another negation term. Yeah, it's like another way to say, uh, like anaerobic or something. Yeah. Oh, um, right. I, the reason, it's funny, I used the word asexual because I was a biology major. So every time I did those Google, but they weren't Google searches back then, it was Excite and Yahoo. Every time I did those searches, though, it always came with biology experiments. And I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, someone just commented lesbians to the rescue, and that is 100% accurate. <laughs> um, it, it, just, just the, like, how much of a debt I oh. owed to, like, other, to queer culture and queer communities for helping me navigate my own story. Yeah, it's interesting, because I feel like, I mean, for me, as I went to an old girls' school, there were quite a few people who were like bi and or or gay and people just kind of assumed that I must be. So rather than being like, we embrace the asexual, they were more like, you know, she's one of us, right? You know, she's really a lesbian. She just hasn't worked it out yet. That was more kind of the reaction that I got at the time was people thinking I just was a, the, the lesbian that hadn't worked it out as opposed to the asexual that hung out with all the bi's. Yeah, um, like what? Uh, Oh, um, I'll raise my hand because I'm bad at interrupting, so I'll raise my hand. <laughs> um, when I was uh, in high school and stuff like that, and all my friends were starting to have sex and all that, and I was like, I was thinking they were having sex just to be cool, just the way people smoke their first cigarette. It's disgusting, but we're doing it because it's cool. I really thought that's how it, why everyone was having sex in high school. Um, <laughs> To point. be honest, um, I have a theory that that was part of the reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, it's a similar, what David was talking about, about like, people starting to develop crushes. Like, I, I did develop crushes because I'm romantic. So up until about senior year high school, I thought I was normal. I hate that term. But, you know, and it wasn't until college, I'd say. It wasn't until college when my college, like, I hung out with the bad girls in high school, the ones that smoked in the bathroom, so they were having sex. So I thought, oh, the bad kids just have sex. You know, 
when I got to college, I went to a U of Chicago, which is like a big, you know, big fancy school. Um, and they were having sex too. And I was like, okay, that's, something's wrong. These people wouldn't just do it to be cool. They're not the kind of people that smoke in the bathroom, you know? So that's, <laughs> that, that was, so I, I would talk about crushes with, uh, with my friends but when they started and I would talk about kissing. I, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm a romantic ace and I know there's different, different spectrums of that, but I was, to me, a kiss was like home plate. And so I would make out with a guy and I would, I would roll over and have my proverbial cigarette after making out and I was done, you know? Um, <laughs> but to them, that was just, you know, a way station. And I, I didn't realize that for years. <laughs> and I feel bad for all the guys that I probably cock blocked. I, I don't know if I should be using bad words like that on here, but <laughs> I, I didn't know. I did not know that I was doing that to them, you know? <laughs> I mean, we're all adults here. I think we can say cock block right now. <laughs> <laughs> It's just funny, yeah. Yeah, I just, you know, if I knew what I know, if I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have dated all those people, but I just didn't know. You know, asexuality wasn't a thing in the 80s, you know. But anyway. Well, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, they've seen, well, they must have been happy to date you, so I'm sure they weren't too mad about it. I mean. <laughs> well, I got, I got ghosted on a lot. Um, <laughs> You know, and and I didn't know why. And looking, and it, and they were like sometimes nice guys. They weren't all jerks. You know, some of them were jerks. But I got ghosted on it. You know, when you're a teenager dating a girl who's not going to put out, you don't have the maturity to tell them. You know, I'm sexually not getting my needs met. We can't continue. You just ghost on the person. You know. <laughs> so, but yeah. Anyway. I just realized that, that there's actually a part three to that story. <laughs> there is a part three. I was like, I better. Jay, do you want to conclude your story? And so it was like a part three. <laughs> sure, and then and then uh, I want to move on. I, I feel like my story gets enough attention, so I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but I'll just read it quick. So then, a second circumstance has got me literally oriented. This that summer, I went to a week long camp called Any Town that dealt with issues of oppression. The, uh, this week was emotionally intense and life changing in more ways than the one listed here. During the day, when we focused on heterosexism and homophobia, the word asexual was put up in a list of terms. Um, trying desperately to contain my excitement, I nonchalantly asked the presenters for more information, which they could not provide. The, wor the word itself was enough. Um, everything that I had been through, everything I had been trying to figure out now had a concrete term. I now had a reason to believe that my lack of sexual attraction was not a problem or insufficient ins insufficiency on my part, but something legitimate in and of itself. I love it that there was a woke camp. That's what that sounds like. A, a I, I went to this camp called Any Town that was all about like race, fighting racism and sexism and heterosexism. And it gave me a bunch of like community organizing and group facilitation training. It was amazing. It's still around. I went to cool. the summer camp had a 20th anniversary for a summer camp that like a ton of people went to because of how powerful it was That's in all cool. of life. Wow, so people watching, look out for this uh, Any Town Woke Camp because it's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm going to call it because that's what it sounds like. <laughs> um, and then here, oh, and then we have some pieces from Lauren on the next slide. So now you can internally <laughs> cringe at things that you wrote 20 years ago, which we're now yes. broadcasting to the world. Um, don't know, probably look at the that. baby. 18 year old Lauren. No, it's fine. It's fine. I'm glad I we, we did have the chance to like review and be like, yes, it's okay. You can put these words up. Um, but uh, I, I mean, do, do you want me to, I can read this out loud since that's yeah. what we're doing. Okay. Uh, there are actually people. So um, there are actually people in the world who will believe me when I say I find sex completely disinteresting, that I find both genders of the human species aesthetically lovely at times. I'm an artist, but find nothing overly appealing about seeing either naked that I love the idea of friendship and close intimacy, but that sex is unappealing, that it isn't something I'm going to outgrow, which I heard a lot, or a figment of my imagination, which I heard a lot, or just failing to meet the right person or reaction to a particular bad experience, wow. And here I was thinking that joking about being asexual was about as far as I could take it. My friends call me the Pope because of my total lack of interest in sex, which is true. Um, so let me get this straight. I'm not crazy. I'm not alone. It's a perfectly valid way to be. It even gets a lovely little name and a creatively titled group. I don't have to feel quite so confused or give into pressure for something I don't want. Wow. Wow. Um, eh. Which I, I do remember that feeling of revelation because I had... Um, recently come from having had a, a traumatically abusive relationship prior to this. And one of the problems was that 
I wasn't interested in sex and that wasn't permissible. Um, and so that was one of those things that's kind of like how hard to disconnect that experience from my introduction to the ace community. But I had been ace my whole life. I had been called the Pope. Um, and, and, you know, my mom would be like, you know, you'll grow out of this. You'll grow out of this phase. Teenagers are like this. Teenagers fall in love and then want to do this. And I, I, I don't think it ever occurred to me that people were doing it for the clout or anything like that. I just internalized everything. Um, I guess when I was really young, um, very, very young, I identified really closely with Artemis, the virgin goddess of the hunt. And I was like, ah, I will, I will declare myself a follower of Artemis in my heart. And then it's okay. It's intentional. I'm keeping myself pure like Artemis. Easy enough to do when you're not interested in doing the thing. Um, but, uh, but I had a number of, like a lot of my friends were kind of, I guess, experimenting. They were in the questioning phase of things in, and this is like, you know, late nineties, early two thousands when this like language was still being developed. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the Bible belt in, in, uh, in Texas. And so like a friend of a friend did wind up being sent to conversion camp and stuff. So like, that was my particular um, my particular community and group was safe, but there was a lack of safety just a few degrees removed from us. Um, and so um, having people who were, as I think frequently happens at Pride events, um, kind of proudly displaying their sexuality, daring people to call them out for boys making out with boys, for example. Um, and then there's like little Pope Lauren hanging out with this group of, 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 of proudly openly sexualizing with each other um, queer folks. Um, I don't know, it, I wound up, um, they would kind of sometimes turn some of that sexuality at me, that like almost hypersexuality at me. And I remember running, crying from a friend's birthday party because one one guy would not stop that, um, even when everyone else was like, can't you tell she's uncomfortable? Um, and that was leading into finding this group because I think I was like, clearly something is wrong with me. I should look it up and see. Um, does this really exist? And I remember it was, it was amazing. Um, and I'm not aromantic. Um, but, uh, it was, it was a really incredible experience to feel like, and, and I'm actually surprised I didn't use the word broken in this. I think I use it later in other, other posts, but that's a term that I've heard again and again and again, even when I briefly dip my toe back into the ACE community, people saying, oh, am I not broken? Because society tells you if you don't have sexual attraction to people, something is wrong with you. Um, and the idea that nothing is wrong with you is really powerful. I mean, that's why we find and, and embrace queer identities and labels and groups and things like that, right? So Yeah, and it's, I think it's probably an experience that's quite reminiscent of what a lot of people kind of navigated. Although I must say, out of all the nicknames you could get, the Pope sounds kind of cool. I mean, it's like... So we had <laughs> the Pope hat and they would greet me. They'd be like, oh, it's Lauren, the Pope. <laughs> and they would <laughs> Like, I feel like there were like, I mean, there were like, could it be like the nun or something, like someone like in a more submissive position, but like the Pope is like the Christian God. Like, that's I, was, kind of, I was the mom friend. So I like think, the king. So, I, so I think like kind of taking like the leadership role, I was the one who was like, okay, now stop fighting children. Don't forget <laughs> to drink water. So I think maybe, maybe. And my friends, for all that, um, it was really hurtful when they were turning their like kind of hyper hypersexuality onto me. I understand why they did it and I know that they still like love me and meant well. It's just you know, being a being a teenager is rough for everyone. So that Yeah, people it. used to do that to me as well. And it's funny because it's like I was never squeamish. People just assumed I was and I found it more annoying than I did disconcerting and it's like now if they were to see me nowadays they'd be like oh we were wasting our time trying to make her squeal <laughs> I don't like I am not a squeamish person but yeah that was definitely just thing of let's see how we can test the asexual let's see like what we can mention or like how explicit we can be and see what she does when really I was sitting there like yeah cool okay like I have the internet too like you can't like, you can't shock me <laughs> like, you guys, you guys um, remember uh, do you remember that movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit I've heard of it. I haven't I've seen, seen it. it. That came out like in 1989 when I was a uh, junior in high school. And one of the characters in that movie is a um, is a sexy rabbit named Jessica Rabbit. And oh, she, she was really sexy, but she didn't do anything sexy. She just looked sexy. And 
she would people like guys would flirt with her and she'd be like i'm not bad i'm just drawn that way that was her quote <laughs> in high school people used to call me jessica rabbit <laughs> because i was like i had you know i I was I was interested in romance, so I would dress to attract boys. But I never showed my cleavage. I always thought that was false advertising. But um, I, I would dress to attract boys and wear mini skirts and stuff that was popular in the 80s. But then my friends always called me Jessica Rabbit because I would date them but never go all the way with them. <laughs> I, I'm like, it was just funny, the, the nicknames that we got. <laughs> I've actually heard people talk about Jessica Rabbit as being an, an ace type character because yes, she's ace, but she's really sexy looking. And that's like, and I, like I said, I probably looked sexy because I was attracting dates. You know, I was trying to attract boyfriends, but I had no idea that that I was I was giving mixed messages. <laughs> I have had oh, these people say Jessica Rabbit to me, I guess, as like a compliment. I wasn't really sure of the actual context. Oh, I, I, was com I was complimented, but they were basically, they were calling me a cock tease is what they were doing. But I, 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 I was still complimented. <laughs> I mean, yeah, when I was in school, my nickname was Jailbait. So, I mean, it wasn't even, nice. which is like kind of slightly worse than cock tease. <laughs> but yeah, like that was, that was my, it was either jailbait or hollow and emotionless because they thought that was why I wasn't experiencing attraction because I was like a walking black hole of a human being. So those, so I would have rather the Pope. That sounds a bit better. Than yeah. Hollow, emotionless jailbait. Girl. Yeah, well, yeah, right. Yeah, the Pope um, is probably the most respectable nickname. <laughs> Um, but can we go on to the next, the next part, which was on, um, I guess kind of the introduction of the spectrum and of kind of like early inclusion slash exclusion within the ACE community. So on the next slide, please, um, there is kind of like the beginnings of the discussion that kind of sounds like it's incorporating gray sexuality, even though they didn't explicitly okay. name it in the way that they, in this quote, kind of talk about bisexuality being somewhere between heterosexuality and homosexuality, which nowadays I'm sure people will probably say that's not the best way to describe bisexuality. But I feel like what they were, the sentiment they were going for was that there was like, you could kind of say that there's like asexual, sexual, and there's people that are kind of in the middle and that it's a spectrum, but it's not like a black and white thing. And I feel like in this quote about the, fuzzy logic is kind of like an early example of people i mean they literally say with this in mind we can view sexuality as, as being degrees of gray rather than black or white which i think is more realistic and accurate way to view our world um and this was in 2001 so this was actually slightly earlier than some of the other quotes that we have um did you notice many discussions kind of embracing the spectrum back then or was it more kind of black and white I mean, I know that like bisexuality was still a thing that people were trying to figure out in the late 90s and early 2000s. Like I said, my my queer experimenting group of friends um, uh, would talk about that. And it had never, even though I, I read all of these, and I think there's something like a later post here from me where I, I, I didn't realize I was biromantic because society told me like, you know, compulsory heterosexuality, the crushes that you're, the feelings you're having towards a man are crushes. Um, but the feelings that you're having towards a, another girl, that's just close friendship. Um, and without the, the drive behind it, you don't necessarily pick up on that. Um, which I don't even know if that's answering the question. Um, but where I was coming from, I didn't, I couldn't even, I don't think I would have even, this would have registered for me. I didn't have the baseline knowledge of it um, to internalize or think about it that way. What about, what about you, David, in terms of, did you notice those, over those much of a discussion around kind of like the gray identities back then? Or was, was things still very like black and white in people's understanding? So I think this was the background of a lot of the fight around libidoism. The, this question of whether people could experience sexual um, arousal or even like whether sexual desire and sexual attraction were distinct. Uh, part of that was people trying to make space for what we now call gray and demi identities. And so I think it was, it was, but there wasn't yet a, uh, there, there wasn't yet, there weren't yet terms for it. Um, we didn't have people, I think the, com the community was still made itself an uncomfortable place for people who identify, who are not, now would identify as gray and demi who are on the spectrum. And so we didn't have them in the community to be advocating for themselves. Uh, and, and it was, and I think one of the central tensions of the community was about whether we're going to create that space. 
um, whether we're going to allow for that space or whether we're going to try to gate keep. And I think that the Aven was in, in many ways about moving away from that, uh, from the the sort of culture of gatekeeping. And that's kind of what the next the next slide is about, right? Anything yeah, and the next slide that? is actually and and um, David J actually contributes to this one. So yeah, the next slide is saying like. I guess it's kind of difficult to unite as a group under one umbrella, namely asexuality. And we've arrived here for different reasons. I was under one Yahoo group that hung out on that was hung up on definitions. It seems to me, like reading some of the messages here, that we each may have our own definitions for certain words like asexuality, celibacy, hetero somebody, bi somebody, homo somebody, etc. I would like us to be able to unite as one group without leaving anyone out due to the choice of words. Can we put together a general loose definition that is all inclusive so that nobody in this group feels left out? We can use that definition to describe the group as a whole. Then we can write articles or something to express our individual reasons for identifying with that group. I'm all for standing together and presenting this invisible orientation to society at large, but we have to have a very basic foundation so that we all agree and build on it from there. And again, that feels so reminiscent of things that we're still talking about nowadays. Um, and then in the next slide, um, DJ says, it seems like a common definition is sort of problematic because in the end, we only sort of have a common identity. A sexuality means very different things to each of us and finding a definition which is all inclusive and still meaningful may be impossible. The reason that we're forming a group isn't because we have a neat common identity, but because we face a common set of issues. It seems like if we form a group, it should be around those issues, not around some difficult to draw identity line. In my 2020 perspective, I feel like nowadays we do have a common definition that I feel like pretty much everybody kind of agrees with. I think the most common one is the lack of sexual attraction definition or possibly like the lack of sexual desire towards another person definition. Um, and I feel like that is kind of, we still have managed to have a definition while still having like an umbrella and it's still being inclusive. Do you think we've, we've kind of managed that or do you kind of stand by the sentiment of back then that it's more about the issues and less about like actually having a definition? I'll, I'll jump in since uh, I was part of this and then I'm curious, Samantha and Lauren, for your thoughts. Um, also, there was a question about whether this is where the invisible orientation comes from. Um, the uh, So I don't think it comes from that post in particular, but the notion of invisibility was something that was talked about a lot. So AVEN is the Asexual Visibility and Education Network. There was yeah. this sense that uh, um, like uh, other queer folks, LGBT folks are facing shame, so they need to count it with pride, and we're facing invisibility, so we need to count it with visibility. Um, David, I have a quick question on the subject of Aven. Way back when, when I first discovered Aven, I had already been part of the Haven for Human Amoeba group. I always thought that Aven was named partly after the Haven, or was that just a coincidence? Uh, that was a coincidence because Aven was named before I discovered that Haven for the Human Amoeba. Existed. I didn't know that. Okay. I actually wondered about I, that. I was too. wondering that too. <laughs> but it was. It was called Haven at first. It was called the Human Asexual Visibility and Education Network. Maybe I like remember that. Maybe I remember that. And then that my roommate—that might be what I'm thinking. But I, yeah, okay. my roommate uh, said that that sounded stupid, so I called it Haven instead. <laughs> um, but I, I like Haven. No, I, <laughs> yeah, I just assumed it was like a branch from Haven. I didn't realize Haven came first, so it was a coincidence. Well, okay. they, they started. Like I started it after Haven was started, but I didn't know Haven existed. So they were independent. Okay. Um, but but with this, right, my, I, my oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm done. Okay. The uh, uh, Yasmin, you're asking about the 2020 perspective, and I feel like words like ace kind of are in between these two posts where we have a term that is an inclusive umbrella term that does describe a wide spectra of identities that the community comes together around like we don't have we don't have asexual awareness week anymore um we uh we don't have many you know even in part because no one really talks about what the acronym means is the only organization that even has the word asexual in the name like we use ace because ace is an umbrella term that does include them that does include um, gray people, and often we're saying ace and aro, and so I think that we've 
we've gotten to a place with the definitions where we can have this sort of big inclusive thing that describes a wide spectrum of identity um, without uh, kind of policing people under a under a common shared definition. And that's what we were, we were looking for, like, for both a word and a way to not police it. I didn't know that. I didn't know that ace. I thought it was just a short form for asexuality. I mean, so that's why it's called I use disease. them as like I I associate asexual as being an umbrella term because we always say asexuality is an umbrella. So I mm -hmm. I would associate asexual as being an umbrella term rather than specifically meaning you have you can't be demisexual and say you're asexual. But again, I guess like it kind of just depends on how you personally um, view the terms because I would kind of use them interchangeably. Oh, I interesting. Yeah, maybe, I, maybe that's legit too. I learned the term, um, I think, long after ACE started being used. Because, um, like, I, I guess I was at some point going to talk about, about like, my experience leaving the community and stuff. But I, I found the term um, ACE, I think, like, later than people had started using it. And I've only kind of seen it as it's been used and possibly misunderstood what it was being used for. Um, so I have this confusion. That doesn't mean that that confusion is widespread. So I'm very excited to hear that. Because I've been telling people I'm ace-ish because I thought ace was ace, asexual. But this is all new. So that's my perspective <laughs> as the person who's like, oh, these new things that have been going on for the past 10 years. Exciting. Discovery. Um, yeah, I can see people commenting. Some are saying that they've used ace as just as an abbreviation for asexual. Some people say that they personally prefer ace to asexual. So I guess it really just depends on how you what term you feel most affiliated with or how much emphasis you place on like the logistics of of certain terms and stuff. Um, but there's a lot of fluidity yeah. in language. Like I like somebody here has a comment about using ace as an umbrella, just like gay can be used as an umbrella instead of homosexuality, which I think is a really interesting way of putting it because I will talk about, I will be like, oh yeah, you know, I'm more gay than I thought I was, but I'm also ace and also bi, but you can say you're more gay, you can call yourself gay, and people can know that that doesn't mean specifically exclusively that. And so I can see that that comparison, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's kind of how I kind of saw it being kind of like akin to it in that kind of way. Um, but the next, what was the, the next slide um, is kind of about um, extending the discussion onto the topic of inclusion versus exclusion in the community. So that kind of relates to your experience, Lauren, in terms of um, what you kind of experienced. Um, could you tell us why you felt like you needed to leave yeah. the community back then? Yeah, which is which is part of why I'm I'm really glad to be asked to be part of this this conversation. Um, like I mean, I've talked about kind of how incredibly important and powerful it was for me to feel like I belonged in this community that I discovered on Haven and then later in Avon. Um, and it was at a time in my life that I was really, really vulnerable and needing that community and that validation. Um, but I think as is common when you have a group of people that have always been an out group and then they have their own safe space, they they de design, um, like they, they designate themselves as the in-group and then they want to define who counts as the in-group. And in order to feel more like the in-group, you can kind of start putting up those boundaries and pushing people out. Um, and so during those early conversations, there was a lot of, you know, what is ace enough? What counts as ace? And at the time, a lot of it was, um, you know, you have to be entirely ace and entirely arrow. Um, and I'm not those things, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, like like Samantha, I definitely get crushes on people or maybe squishes on people, depending on, I love that term. That's another one that I discovered recently and was just delighted by. Um, but um, I felt like a lot of people were saying like, you don't belong. This isn't where you belong. You're not, you're not ace. What are you doing here? Go away. Um, and so I did go away because I, I, I don't know. I, I felt that the inclusion and the support and the validity and validation that I needed was, was, being denied me because I, I didn't deserve it. Um, because it wasn't that I thought, oh, how mean, they're kicking me out of the space I belong. I internalized, oh, I don't belong here. I'm not ace. This is not a title I can use for myself. And so kind of carried this feeling of, well, I'm not ace enough for the ace community, but I can't be allosexual functionally. Um, so I'm just broken. Clearly that fear that I had that I thought didn't apply to me, it turns out it does. Um, and it was this really, like, it was honestly a pretty traumatic experience. Like, 
part of me, even after being asked to be part of this panel, was still afraid that the people organizing this panel was, hey, actually, Lauren, you're, you're not ace enough to be on this panel. I'm sorry, we're going to have to let you go, which is completely unreasonable. There's like nobody here has ever given me any reason to believe that. Um, but but that sort of thing cuts deep. And I know that I'm not the only person who's had this experience. Like some people kind of grow out of needing a community for support. But um, like I had hoped that the the ACE community in the ensuing like almost 20 years had put that gatekeeping aside um, and that people were embracing the fullness of the umbrella. Um, and so uh, hearing that there's still some gatekeeping, even if it's changed from like the libidinist to um, whatever other areas of gatekeeping people have, um, like th for me, the thought that there might be um, young vulnerable people who are kind of going through what I'm going through or what I went through kind of breaks my heart. Um, and so like part of why I'm here is I have an agenda, which is if, if any of you watching this um, now or in the archive, if you tend to be kind of defensive about this is what asexuality is and I'm going to, like those people shouldn't be here, um, consider what they could receive from the community and give back to the community and what the cost of keeping them is. Um, like the, the point of queer communities is for people who need that sense of community to be supported. Um, and I think it's really important that people keep that in mind. Like for me, hearing about the activism that you've been doing, Asma, in the past few years, like it's it's fascinating. I went I went um like a couple of days ago and I was like looking on Wikipedia trying to catch up on all these wonderful things. And part of me is like, what if I could have been part of that? What could that have meant to me? What could I have given back to the community? And obviously it's not too late. I can become part of the community. I can I can get the validation and support that I need and I can give back. Um, but I just, I think that it's really important to try to resist the temptation for gatekeeping. You can belong without having to tell someone that they don't count. Um, and so I imagine, cause it sounds like there's a lot of people here who are saying they relate to this experience, um, or talking so freely and comfortably about the umbrella, that a lot of people don't have this, but, um, the fact that I've, I've heard it's still present, I, I beseech you, please don't do that. Um, Yes, definitely. Thank you for sharing that. Was it was the exclusion back then mainly based on like the not being a row thing? Was it or was it Large, more like largely? You know, like, they were like they were like you have crushes on people. What are you doing here? You you're interested in some guy. Why are you here? You're not ace. You want to kiss him? You're not ace. You don't count. Yeah. That's so, I'm going to assume like was it I guess maybe there was a was there like an overpopulation of particularly um, angsty aroaces back then that have this idea that you can't be like interested I, in people at all if you're asexual. So this is something I've thought about a lot over the years and I think that there's there's kind of a, a purity uh, thing that you'll see in communities like the like what is a true this what is a true that and so the most extreme extreme version the most easily defined like does not have sexual interests and does not have romantic interests. And those are clear cut. That's like the purest form of this idea. Um, yeah. And so I think that people kind of gravitated towards that as like the farthest extremist example. Um, I rather, also, I, also, I also think that people have, people have historically had a hard time separating romance drives from sex drive or, or romantic and, and sexual or whatever you want to call it. Um, because, you know, so like, if you like to kiss boys, you therefore must like to go all the way. You know, mm -hmm. if you are asexual, you therefore must not be interested in kissing boys. You know, it's like, and so people like you and I have helped introduce the idea to the ace community. Oh yeah, you could love to kiss and make out and still not want to do tab A slot B, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting because I feel like that is something we kind of take for granted now because nowadays it's not even oh, you can kiss people and be asexual. It's like, hell, you can be like covered in freaking leather with a ball gag in your mouth and having tons of sex and still be asexual. Like pretty much anything goes nowadays. I really? feel like- yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. For me, for me, for me <laughs> being covered in leather with a ball gag is, is an artistic <laughs> statement as opposed to a sexual statement. I like that kind of stuff, but I think of it as oh, art. A lot I don't of think of it as sex. There's some very kinky aces and there's aces who still yeah. are considered asexual and still have sex. And I feel like we've definitely taken it further than you can want to give a kiss on the cheek and still be asexual. Like this is 2020, you can do whatever the hell you want now. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm, even I'm back, to, even back in 1980, you could do whatever you want. People just didn't know these terms, you know? 
Yeah, so it's like one of those things you just kind of take for granted, especially as like when I first like interacted with the ACE community, I was kind of under, I guess, a similar experience to, to DJ as someone who's Aero Ace. I was kind of like assumed that a lot of people would be Aero Ace and that they kind of went together until I realized a bunch of people that I met, they weren't Aero Ace. They were in relationships. They wanted relationships. They had partners. Some of those partners weren't asexual. Some of them were having sex with those partners. And I was like, oh, wow, this is actually a pretty normal experience. And it sounds like that's something that like I wouldn't have experienced had I been in some of the online spaces in the early 2000s in comparison to just like knowing people now, I wouldn't have gotten that impression. I got a boyfriend, but I was disqualified. (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy how those things have like fortunately changed. I think that we have, while there's definitely still issues of exclusion, I think that we've kind of worked on it quite a lot. I feel like we're definitely... Good. We're open. I mean, my kind of image of my work is probably would not have gone down so well in 2001 if I would if I had been the age I am now and like doing activism back then. I'm sure people probably wouldn't have taken to it the same way as they do now. Um, so I think that's definitely a sign of like the growth in the community. And I'm sure you'll have a much more fun time nowadays than you did back then, Lauren. <laughs> I, I, I'm getting. I'm, I'm very strongly getting that, and I, I, I love that. I'm, I'm very glad. I'm very glad. Oh, in our next, actually, in the next slide, which kind of goes into the um, introduction of conversations about romantic orientation, um, we have some things that Samantha said. Um, so now you get to see things that you said back in twenty years ago. So I hope you. Uh, I hope makes this me feel old. Up. Makes me feel old <laughs> to think I was 30 20 years ago. Damn. Anyway. <laughs> um, um, do you want to read out what you said back then? Sure. Um, wait, hold on. Let me zoom it in because I'm old and can't read. Okay. Hi, folks. I'm a 30-year-old single female practicing psychiatrist. I describe myself as, quote, hetero-emotional, unquote, a word I've coined for myself, but asexual. No history of sexual abuse, no history of imposed religion or morals, never spontaneously have had a sex-related fantasy, not about women, men, women, anyone or anything without it having been a therapist assigned task. For me, fantasy has always reached its euphoric endpoint with kissing. In my early 20s, I had even experimented with physical intimacy in the context of two separate loving relationships, the only result being confusion as to why people would find this so pleasurable. I would not mind my indifference to sexuality if it were not for my desire for emotional intimacy. What I meant by that at the time was romantic intimacy, but um, in recent years, I have received professional opinions that maybe I actually do not have libidoist desire, libidinal desires, but just the desire for emotional intimacy. And we're actually, we're kind of crediting you, Samantha, as being one of the first people to introduce the fact that asexual people can be romantic on on the kind of online ace spaces because it, like, I mean, there isn't really much earlier record of people kind of having those kind of in-depth conversations or pushing that perspective until you did it. So you're kind of pioneering in that sense. Yay. So well, <laughs> I, I do remember when I very first joined, I remember like, where are all the other aces that have romance drives? So I think I was trying to push the idea that, that that's possible. <laughs> You know, because on the next yeah. slide, you're actually the first person on record to there's a fly flying around my head. Um, <laughs> the first person on record to use the term hetero romantic and specify interest in romance but not sex with the opposite gender. Um, and yeah, that's kind of like the I see it's like a kind of early introduction of like the whole split attraction model that we use now. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, um, oh yeah, it's funny because like in 2013, I went to the pride parade and met David and a bunch of other aces and stuff and people were using those terms. And I was like, that's weird. I thought I made those up. I wonder if that came from me. Like I thought that, but I never pursued it because I was like, there's no way to get proof of that. You know? And so when you guys, when I learned about this, I was like, oh my God, there's proof. <laughs> right so, there. Yeah, it, it gives me such warm fuzzies to know that I've helped younger aces, you know, be able to define themselves because it might help them. Like it's helped me be able to find relationships better since I've defined myself as hetero romantic. I, I haven't found another ace, but I am dating a guy who's poly and I let him sow his oats elsewhere and so far it's working. So I've heard of I've, <laughs> I've heard, heard of that too. for aces. I've heard of poly relationships 
like that with aces involved. So yeah, there's a lot more polys in my at least in Tucson. There's a lot more poly guys to choose from than there are aces. So I just kind of <laughs> settled with the, you know, and I, you know, just you just work on. I, unfortunately, I'm not the jealous type, so I guess thank goodness that works. But yeah, in fact, I'm not jealous at all. I wouldn't want him doing that to me. <laughs> <laughs> But um, anyway. <laughs> um, well, I, yeah. I feel like that kind of thing probably wouldn't work out too badly for me either. And we do now have definitive proof that you kind of, you coined the term heteromantic. And it's so now to all of the ace historians and stuff that are watching this, when you're citing <laughs> terms and you're going like, when did these start being used? Like, where did they start? Where did they come from? The 14th of January, 2002 was Yay. the beginning of people introducing these phrases to the ace community and and another thing it's so funny to see that like you and dj were literally talking in 2002 about this because dj responded and said i'm curious um can we go to the next slide yeah he said i'm curious how you define romantic what does it mean to be romantically attracted to someone i'm um, and I'm curious also, how do you define romantic relationships outside of the realm of sexuality, which is something I've always wondered as an aromantic person, I've always like, <laughs> that's something I've always tried to work out. But it's, um, oh, David, sorry, you can read the rest of this one if you oh, want. Um, I, I don't, this is just me being like confused and snarkly aero, so I feel a little embarrassed. Um, because because my, my definition, like I saw romance as this script that people engaged in that was about sexuality, it was about monogamy, and uh, it was about heteronormativity. And so the, the notion that there were romantic feelings that one could have independent of that script was a totally new thing for me. Um, and yeah, so th this was just me trying to wrap my head around that. I can't help but point out how similar that sounds to me to the like these these high schoolers must be having sex because that's what they're pressured to do because it just this is something that's so alien to you it's just not how you exist yeah. just like thinking about having sex as a high schooler seems very alien to to like people who maybe are asexual but not aromantic like that's so interesting how different and varied our experiences are but, and well, it's I mean, funny I because I work. I think I I don't even know if I replied to David's post because when I read that, I was like, I was only 30, you know, I was kind of, you know, I was young, you know, I mean, not that 30 is young per se, but, you know, I was, we were all like, we all didn't know much about asexuality and the terms and so forth. So when I read that, I was like, what do you mean? How do you define romantic? It's obvious, you know, like I was, the, I was again, you know, so I don't even, but now I realize that at least half of all aces out there are A-roll. If I knew that back then, I would have like, typed up a very good reply to it <laughs> but I was like what do you mean <laughs> like like it's just I was such a I was actually a love addict and I've, I've been in recovery for 20 years and if I was not ace I probably would have been a sex and love addict but anyway so at the time romance was just part of what defined who I was you know but so it, the asexuality was what got me to realize I had an addiction at a younger age a lot of other people were in the 12-step meetings in their 40s, you know, they, they had an affair and their spouse was leaving them, whatever. In my case, I had been ghosted on hundreds of times and it led to de suicidal depression. I didn't know why I was ghosted on so much until years later when asexuality became a thing. And I was like, oh, it wasn't because there's something wrong with me. It's not my personality. It was because I'm a sexual. But anyway, um, so romance was such a part of who I was. I was like, what do you mean? How do you not know what romance is? <laughs> like, I was just, you know, ignorant. We were both ignorant. What the hey, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to cut in here. Um, <laughs> apologies, uh, Yasmin, for um, I I'm just going to cut in because um, yeah. By the way, I find this fascinating, and it, it's really amazing to see where the romantic terms. I think it's it's also interesting that um that Samantha's terms um are it's not just heteromantic but also homoromantic and biromantic um um but not aromantic. And I, I find and we, we we will come to that later. I, I find that really interesting. So um. Just before we move on, um, I'm going to take myself off because we we have a little bit of we have another special guest I'd like to bring on, um, Nat Titman, who we're very grateful um, to uh, as, as ha is, is going to join us. There's a limit on how many people can be there on cam, and at the moment I've been um, performing this really useful function of being the top person who is um, cutting, who is taking up the space where the banner is, and so I'm afraid that um, somebody else will have to do that. But I'll try and move people around so that. We're talking, so I'm going to take myself off. And while I while I sort myself out, then please um continue. And um yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I'm really interested to hear more about this. 
Well, I mean, I was going to say, speaking of kind of like, um, kind of like oblivious moments, the next um, slide is actually one of your very ace moments, Samantha, where you were saying that you kind of misunderstood what the term sleeping with meant. Um, yeah. Oh, and hello to our newcomer. Hi. Hi, now. Can you introduce yourself hello. to everyone quickly? Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, I'm uh, Matt Sipman. I uh, was, I wrote the big asexuality FAQ uh, in 2002. And in early 2002, I also created the uh, asexuality community on LiveJournal, uh, which was very much uh, reactionary to the very anti-sexual community that was based there when I first arrived. Uh, do you want me to do a full introduction or? Was it an anti-sexual, non-asexual community or an anti-sexual, asexual community? Okay, that, this is a whole thing. Uh, oh. so, <laughs> um, so basically, I would probably refer people to the talk I did in uh, 2012 at the first World Pride Asexuality Conference, uh, which I think is on YouTube. There's also a write-up on my blog, graphicexplanations.info. Uh, but the, the really quick version of that is that... Uh, the early community uh, had a huge number of taboos and uh, lots of people involved uh, were, uh, there was no definition of what asexuality was. And basically what most people were going by was people that didn't have sex and didn't experience sexual attraction and didn't do anything sexual in any way. And the community was full of people that did experience uh, romantic and sexual attraction, sorry, romantic attraction and had kinks and had uh, enjoyed sex and so on. But none of that, that was all massive taboos back in the day. So it's really hard, uh, it's, it's really hard to summarize this. Again, there's a really long talk about it. But uh, basically you got two types of asexual people and no, that's a ridiculous binary generalization, which I don't stand by at all. You get two types of uh, reactions. One was people who were talking about their own experience, and the other was very much everyone who is sexual is a terrible person. And so there were just communities full of people basically slut shaming. It was just like aggressive slut shaming, um, which was really uncomfortable. And it was really difficult to actually talk talk about asexuality with people. That one thing that Haven was pretty good for is that it didn't have that. So, uh, yeah, I realize now I've talked for ages and still didn't really introduce you know, myself. No, well, I mean, that's, but, what, that's uh, what we're here <laughs> for. I mean, that actually connects to some things we are talking about earlier, about, like, the early exclusionism that, like, Lauren experienced on the basis of, like, if you have crushes or if you want to kiss somebody, then that doesn't count as asexuality, which is so different to the perspective nowadays. But I guess it kind of goes to show, like, how the attitudes have changed because I don't notice much, like, anti-sexuality stuff within the ace community much nowadays. It seems kind of like it's leaning in quite a sex-positive um, way in 2020. So it's interesting that like, that kind of adds another perspective onto how that was more prevalent back then. Um, yes. So thank you for sharing uh, that, helpful. I would very much say that uh, I came from a very queer, sex-positive background. Uh, I, I'd heard I'd heard about asexuality. I knew the term asexuality in the 90s because it was discussed in uh, disability rights activism, all over disability rights activism. Uh, it's all over early um, autism rights. Uh, it's all over, uh, I mean, I was in the, um, I was in various online communities, genderqueer communities, trans communities, and so on. And we were discussing asexuality in there, like not massively, but it was a term people knew. It was heavily associated with uh, androgyny. Uh, 
to the point where it was conflated, there were textbooks. You could look in textbooks and see that it would say that asexuality was being uh, intersex or neuter. Uh, it was all conflated. And again, I direct people to the talk in the blog post because I, I am... Um, my background to have Haven for the human amoeba is that I basically didn't think it was very good. And I would, uh, I think I discovered that I have made a post there, which is just like casting shade on everyone, or at least the <laughs> organizers. We'll get to that in a while. But um, yeah, I was on a quite, I guess, radical genderqueer communities. And I also, I wrote the big, the, Avon's first big FAQ, like there was a very short one. I wrote one that was effectively a like a sex positive inclusive manifesto. Uh, so uh, if we were doing like a really general asexual history talk, then we could talk about the massive overcorrection that happened like later on in the community that kind of pushed aromantic people out because kind of at the start, it was very much aromantic was what aromantic and asexual were kind of the same thing and everyone that didn't really fit that was saw that it was a massive taboo and wasn't mentioning it and again i i literally have gone on about this on stage for over an hour so i will <laughs> step back now and we can talk about things when they come up thanks well i mean well the point we were on just before you got here was kind of i was, I was mentioning the um incredibly ace moment that um, Samantha had um, saying about how, um, I think mistaking the, what the term sleeping with meant and using that as like a description of just like literally sleeping with people and then that not actually being how other people interpreted it. And there's a note that says that apparently there's a threat on Avon with over 800 pages of people having incredibly ace moments. So <laughs> it goes to show like how we all kind of have that kind of experience. Um, I still but have ace moments at this age. I think you just have them for life. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I still sometimes where I'll be like, oh God, I didn't even like think of it that way. And I'm like, I thought I knew all this stuff already, but there's always gonna yeah. be something sexuality is so vast there's always going to be one thing you haven't heard of or didn't think of oh, yeah. you're be like, oh that's how people are taking it that's what some people are doing okay um so i think we yeah we'll probably will always have those moments but one of the next topics <laughs> further down on the slides it was actually a non-romantic the loon is in my age group <laughs> one of the commenters i think is in my age group <laughs> anyway <laughs> um yeah, so one of the um, things was um, non-romantic relationships. And there was a post by someone called um, Boston Girl talking about kind of like the concept of having a primary relationship that isn't grounded on romance or being in love or sex, but purely on friendship, which sounds like an early kind of conceptualization of queer platonic relationships back in 2002. And while they don't actually use that language, it's interesting that there's like, that people were talking about whether that kind of relationship is possible and whether people could see themselves in an exclusive relationship that is platonic and not romantic and not sexual. Um, so yeah, did you, did, was that kind of like a conversation that any of you saw going on back then? The kind of early concepts of queer platonic relationships? Yeah. Some, somebody just commented, it just showed it. I, I wonder if Boston Girl is a reference to Boston marriage. That's exactly what I was thinking when I read that post, because a Boston marriage is just that. It's a it's a platonic friendship where the two people, um, it, I guess for some reason it was more common among women, I don't know why, but where two people, two straight people would live together, you know what I mean? This is like an old fashioned term, you know, uh, where two straight people would live together and, and live happily ever after, you know, without any romance or sex or anything. Yeah, I mean, and they were roommates. Yeah, yeah, right. I know it does sound a lot. Just <laughs> yeah, it does sound a lot like a like a kind of a, a concept of like roommates, but then also kind of like a kind of queer platonic vibe. I hadn't heard the concept. Yeah. Or today, but it is an interesting, like I could use it as a reference in the future if anyone would know what it meant. Um, 
the next the next slide boston girl does specifically mention reading the book boston marriages so i'm, I'm guessing oh, yeah. that's probably where she got it from i'm assuming yes she, there's um, there because um there's also a reference of yeah yes they say that about the whole um boston marriages and people were also kind of discussing a concept or state of uncouplehood um, the kind of the euphoria that can arise after a romantic breakup, which doesn't sound like a distinctly asexual thing. I'm sure a lot of people feel that it, depending on what end of the breakup they're on, um, that kind of sense of freedom. But then there's also interestingly, um, a con a conversation about intimacy and a kind of, about a kind of non-sexual intimacy and define as persons defining it as being a state of being completely yourself around someone never having to fear about them hating you or changing their mind about you on a whim. They love you deeply and you love them. Um, you trust them with your life and they mean the world to you and you to them. Kind of like the kind of yeah. win. Yeah, that, of that, one's, that one's my post. <laughs> yeah, so I, I like half of them are under my name, half of them are under the name that I did. Yeah, it's really interesting to look back on what I had to say about intimacy um, which is a couple of slides down. So I hope you don't mind. I'm like taking over. No, 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 um, I'm that not slide. in control of who's like flicking through the slide, so we could go a bit faster than. <laughs> <laughs> then we yeah, do... If you could go to the on intimacy one, um, which is I think after on couplehood. Yes, there you go. Um, like this, I think is interesting, and it's something that I've just as I've been reflecting on it, kind of thinking about. Um, uh, so I tend to have extremely intimate friendships because that's just kind of how I conceive of friendships or connections to people, um, which has led to problems in the past with people um, falling in love with me or having this like really intense fixation that is not what, uh, what uh, it's not reciprocated, um, but the intensity of the relationship that I, that I have um, seems more like a romantic relationship to people sometimes. Um, and, and it's interesting uh, trying to define what intimacy is, how it define like, like how it is different from romance. Because like, I do have romantic urges, but then I also have these very intimate friendships. And apparently not everybody has the intimate friendships the way I do. Um, so it's just, uh, I don't know. And I wonder whether somehow that's like some manifestation of my aceness, the, the way that I fulfill my need for intimacy with friendships. And I still do have the, the romance. Um, urge as well, but it's it's not. It's, I don't think it's as overwhelming, for example, as Samantha's. Like I could tell you the number of crushes I think I've had in my life. Now that I realized that I had crushes on my female friends that I didn't realize were crushes growing up, um, but it's 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 been like you know maybe ten people in my thirty six years of life, um, which, as I understand it, for people who get crushes, is not a very big number. Um, I don't know. I wonder kind of like how, because because even people who are um, who are like eras still have the need, to, I think, largely to be intimate in some ways. I think this is something that DJ has where he's very intimate with his friends and or with his family in a platonic, non, non romantic way. And that's just, it's, for me, this is interesting to kind of catch up and learn about this. Um, sorry, I feel like I'm just rambling about this, but. Um, no, no, it's interesting. Um, someone just asked, someone was asking what an ace moment is. Um, it's one of those things where, I don't know, maybe if you weren't asexual, you would have picked up on something sooner than <laughs> one of those moments where you're like, oh, that's what that meant, or that's what that was. I was interpreting it quite differently to someone who maybe wasn't asexual, like that kind of situation. Um, but yeah, I do. I kind of, I've heard quite a few times from asexual people about how asexual people kind of place more value on friendship sometimes, or particularly like Aeroist people kind of place more value on friendships and kind of put the same amount of like emotional effort into them as you would do like a romantic relationship, especially if you're not having those. So that is something I have heard discussed before. Um, so I do think that that is probably a, a pattern for us. Um, but the next slide actually was the first um, mention of the word aromantic. And it took until April, 2002, before someone called Max Nova 100 um, said, what would be an appropriate term for somebody who's not quite asexual, but dreads the concept of being in a relationship, a romantic LOL. So it's funny that they kind of said it like, would that even be a thing? And it's like, turns out actually really is a thing. Um, that is a word that now we use all the time. 
Well, it's interesting that on considering all the conversations that were happening about romantic orientations and queer platonic relationships and all those other things, it took until April 2002 before anyone actually said, hey, what about the people that like aren't experiencing like, like, should we have like a word for that kind of thing? I don't know, maybe there were other places on the internet where just aromantic people were and they were already talking about that. I don't know. But I do think it's interesting that it took so long for that to kind of come up as a concept, especially since you were kind of mentioning that it seems like there were definitely aromantic people around then. Well, but you know no what? The word. You know what I bet? Um, before I brought up the idea of hetero, homo, and bi romantic, maybe it was just kind of generally assumed that all aces were aro. Because when I when I when I introduced my terms, I was it seemed to me that all, all the other aces that I was interacting with were aro. And I was like, what about people like me? And I was like putting in my terms. So maybe aromantic was just implied until I introduced my terms, and then 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 they needed the term aro to have as a contrast term for the other terms. Does that make sense? And to yeah. that this point, is, about, go ahead. Sorry, um, I think that the only reason it's coming up here is because this is someone who's saying they're not quite asexual and then they're trying to go, they don't feel that asexual fits them, therefore they're reaching for a word that's, it's like asexual, but just for the romance side. And therefore, I, I, I do agree with you, uh, Sam, that this is basically having having the default assumption that the that basically everybody is a row because there was still, a, there was absolutely, once I'd written the FAQ, I was getting all the emails from people who'd read the FAQ and had problems. So trust me, people were very, very insecure about this sort of thing at the time. It was kind yeah. of overwhelming the amount of kind of being an agony uncle I was having to do. So insecure um, about experiencing romantic attraction or insecure about not? Uh, about experiencing romantic attraction, about having crushes, about having um, fantasies about um, fictional characters or other people that they don't want to be involved, about kink, massively about kink, about uh, engaging in solo sexual activity, um, just so many, so many things people were and these things weren't being discussed. They were. I was getting that stuff sent to me. I was getting lots of direct messaging and that kind of thing. But there was, there was a a, a big taboo. And it was interesting for me because I'd come from, you know, at that time I was. I think I was president of my university LGBT society at that point. And I think that, yeah, I was a regular at. I think I'd been to two years of BICON, UK BICON, bisexuality. Well, officially they changed it to bi way before that because some people weren't sexual. Like they had this understanding. There was a discussion in like 2001 about bisexuality for people that weren't, uh, that didn't have, that didn't, that didn't do sex. They weren't using asexual, but um, I mean, I ran an asexuality workshop the next year and got huge numbers of people coming out about how much that meant to them and talking about other types, which was them feeding back. Um, like in 2000, the, the bi community had a huge poly contingent and I'd gone there in 2001 and been talking about how amazing that was for me. Um, I also realized I didn't do my introduction properly to talk about how um, in, in 1999, I was in a, asexual relationship with a uh with my partner we for about two years we were together and I had been very insecure about sexual sexuality stuff before that due to being asexual met someone else very romantic we didn't even kiss for weeks we just rubbed noses it was it was sickeningly adorable um and then later my partner uh, changed some changed medications and developed a sex drive. And it was so difficult for me. And that was why I was seeking out the asexuality community. Before that point, I thought I was fine with it. And then it was just like, oh, okay. Um, and it was, um, 
Yeah. So I, but then I joined the community and sensed very much that actually saying that I'd been having sex with someone else and enjoying it was just not a thing I could say. Um, but I did put it into the FAQ uh, along with many, many other things that were complete taboo because we were, we were kind of being reactionarily reactionary against the anti-sexual people and trying to uh like i haven't i've lost my email archive but i did research this in 2012 and i did have lots of emails from various genderqueer friends and trans friends who were and uh disability community friends who were kind of saying yeah you've got to do this you've got to say that um they were also asexual it, it, this was discussed um I mean, I feel like in British culture, this was discussed a lot more because people talked about asexuality about, uh, they talked about asexuality with Boy George, talked about asexuality with Doctor Who, 1996, the TV movie, everyone was saying, my doctor is asexual, he should not be kissing, all of this stuff. So to me, it was, it was something I was really aware of. And then I'd been in genderqueer, communities and trans communities before that and in there everyone when you talked about asexuality people were still thinking you were talking that it was linked so I would say that I'm you know I I'm genderqueer I'm angiogyne or I I'm you know whatever I was using at that point non-gen no I wasn't using non-gendered uh gender neutral whatever I was using back in 2001 2000 and people were saying oh like asexual and all of that Again, I have emails, or I did have emails, which I've saved of people saying, responding to my FAQ and asking about uh, androgyny and uh, this uh, famous 1989 episode of Sally Jesse Raphael talk show with Toby, who was, uh, who was androgynous, asexual, and uh, also... Describe, described himself as neuter, but was uh, intersex. And that had really stuck in lots of people's minds. We were still getting emails about that in 2002, 2003. And I've oh, spoken too much, so I've shut up. <laughs> it's interesting to hear about references in like British culture from back then. I mean, I was born in 96, so I, I don't even know which Doctor Who we had in 96. <laughs> I only remember Christopher Appleton onwards. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to hear that. I mean, I didn't hear that anyone mention the term asexual until I was 15. So that wasn't until about 2009, 2010, before I heard anyone use that phrase in any capacity. And that was someone who hung out on Tumblr a lot. And I feel like if they hadn't, they wouldn't have known the phrase outside of talking about amoebas and flowers. Um, but it's interesting talking about like gender identities because that's actually the next and final topic that we have. Um, because looking at it from the beginning, as David Jane noted, there was kind of, or at least based on my observations and things I've read here, it seems like I feel like conversations about gender identity were kind of not so prominent in like mainstream culture back then. I mean, I don't remember people talking about like different types of gender expression when I was in secondary school and that wasn't even that long ago. Um, and back then, the kind of definitions, people mentioned men and women a lot and didn't so much mention non-binary until a bit later on. Um, so it's interesting to see some like earlier types of um, conversations about that. Um, this one, again, is from Boston Girl saying, I'm a woman biologically and have a tomboy look. I don't like talking about myself as a woman. Um, and saying I'm not trying to look for a general rule like all asexuals are, but I'm asking myself whether others in this group have a clearly defined for yourself gender identity. And I feel like nowadays there are a lot of asexual people who are openly like non-binary and agender and all those things. Um, but I'm curious as to whether that was a noticeable thing back then as well in your observations or ever it's more of a recent thing. Uh, there were absolutely uh, non-binary and genderqueer people around and we were talking about asexuality we weren't doing it in Haven for the Human Amoeba because they they said it was some men and women in the discussion in, in the description so we didn't join I mean I created my own community I, I, I took one look at that one and went excuse me my phone is vibrating um, so 
I mean, it turns out I did get sent a message that's probably on this list that I did join mostly just to be snarky at them about gender stuff. But I, in my experience, we were talking about uh, asexuality or like, we were talking about this kind of stuff in like poly spaces, in, um, in trans and some trans and genderqueer spaces. And we weren't so much look specifically looking for other spaces until they were made explicitly inclusive, like uh, my community and Avon. Right. So was it a case of that, like, they just didn't, because, for example, um, David Jay was saying that when he had first, like, put out, like, a description of asexuality, at first he had said men and women until he realized that he should have put on made it more like gender inclusive and then he did? Was it a case of like, they just hadn't thought about it because it was like 2001 or were they actively like, no, you're not meant to be here? I mean- I, I'm very, very aware Sam's had a hand up for ages. Oh, so. yeah, well, I'll, wait, I'll wait till you guys are finished with your with what you're talking about. Cause what I, what I was gonna bring up is, is something based on the comments I'm reading, so. Okay. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, cause like it's almost embarrassing for me, um, because the the next the next uh, slide is me talking about being like a girly girl, cause I have all these trappings of being feminine, um, because at the time, like I literally didn't know that there were anything like there was anything besides the gender binary. I'd never heard the term gender binary. I, I didn't know what any of this was or what any of, of it meant, um, and so I I wouldn't be surprised if. Haven had been created by somebody who was just operating out of ignorance rather than intentional exclusion. And it's for me really interesting to look back and realize how I feel like these conversations have become more normalized outside of just the communities directly affected and how I guess it's really sad to think back on people who would have been excluded because people like me were ignorant. Um, so it's interesting to hear Nat talk about feeling like men and women is an exclusive way, like an excluding way of, of saying that. Whereas like for me as my little 18 year old self growing up in the Bible belt, um, as I was then, I wouldn't even have thought of that because I didn't know that such a such a, an identity existed outside of being a man or a woman. Um, and that just, I don't know, I think that's really sad that that, that exclusion was there. Yeah, I, I definitely think we shouldn't forget other communities who were talking about asexuality before our communities existed. Uh, for example, in 1995, at the uh, uh, at one of there was a, I wish I'd got details of this out. Uh, there was a conference, uh, an autistic run conference in 1995 in America somewhere. Um, that had a panel about asexuality with people on the panel identifying as asexual in 95. And it's written about and mentioned in uh, the Asan collection, Loud Hands, I think. Uh, this is all referenced in my, in my blog post and the video I did, so the talk I did. So please go back and look at that. But, um, Absolutely, asexuality was being talked about in disability communities, disability rights, disability, uh, disability arts, all of that kind of thing. I mean, mostly they were reacting saying they weren't asexual, but they were talking about it and it was recognized as this thing that was associated with human beings. And again, this was talked about a lot in queer communities as uh, if you look at like how, whether, any discussion of whether like queer people could be shown on television or in film always use the terms asexual, asexual to talk about how they had to have like a completely asexual persona in order to in order to be acceptable in popular culture. Like there's writing about this from like the 80s that's using those terms. So I I guess it's just like um yeah, my perspective is interesting because I was kind of coming from places where this was being talked about um, and kind of trying to kind of bring other perspectives. Um, and I think the first email I ever sent DJ, sorry, David J was that, um, was responding to, uh, as, as he said earlier, one of the early emails he got was someone saying you shouldn't say men and women. So that had been changed to a, a spectrum or a continuum between like women and men. 
cats or, or between like attracted to men and attracted to women or whatever it was. And I, my, my first email is like this really long thing about how uh, in the genderqueer communities I was involved in, like we laughed at that kind of thing and we, we were completely like really against that and so on and so on. But anyway, yeah, again, I'm talking too much. <laughs> That was a response to something in the original FAQ. And, uh, um, oh, sorry, Nat, I didn't mean to send you behind the duck. Um, just, just saying that in that in that same early time where it was getting talked about, and I did this research, but I can't find it. There were a bunch of early Usenet groups where there were people who were showing up and saying that they were using the word asexual and saying that they identified this way and asking if there were other people uh, and not finding them. So it was, I, I think of I think of this time as there was these, a few conferences happening, there were discussions happening within specific communities. There were a lot of people sort of like trying to find one another, but it wasn't, uh, it, 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 most people who were looking to find other aces couldn't find other aces. Uh, and that feels like what began to shift around 2000, really 2004, but kind of starting to shift from 2000 to 2004. And um, Samantha, you have something that you wanted to say ages ago, so let's give you yeah. an opportunity to say. It was it was just something I was reading in the comments. It wasn't related to the gender thing, so that's why I was I didn't want to interrupt it. <laughs> um, I, I was reading a bunch of comments about um, people with autism spectrum and being ace, and it. I I myself was diagnosed with Asperger's as a kid. I guess now it's considered autism, but I still prefer to use. But so I find that fascinating that there may be some neurobiological correlate, but you know, in the uh, um, what is it, the um, autistic spectrum with however the connection in the brain between romantic and sexual uh, activity, you know, like there's a dis there's some sort of disconnect there. I'm guessing as part of the whole autistic um, um, ne neurobiology, I guess. So I didn't know what what you guys thought about that. There was just a bunch of comments in there about that a yeah, second I ago. That was a lot. And I've seen people kind of have that conversation, like mentioning like that co potential correlation. I don't know much about it personally, though. I, I haven't. So. I think it's just at the, at the very beginnings. I know it somewhere in Australia, Australia, they're doing research on asexuality and how it could be correlated with autism spectrum um, brain chemistry. So it's just fascinating to me. I'm a psychiatrist, so of course, I think it's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> and I have Asperger's and I'm ace. So I think it's cool, but I didn't know if you guys, what your thoughts were on that, you know, if you have any, you know, I, I just see a bunch of commenters uh, saying I, that they've got Asperger's or, or uh, autism. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm autistic. Uh, I didn't have that confirmed until 2012, but I certainly suspected in the early 2000s and have been looking at lots of disability rights related stuff around that time. Um, I, I would mostly say that autistic people are more likely to uh, question things and not take things for granted and so on. And if, if we recognize that we are not like other people Okay, so undiagnosed or unrecognized, because I don't want to like medicalize things, autistic people are kind of more likely to feel different from everyone and be desperately trying to find out why they feel different. Uh, yeah. like my early, my introduction posts to other, like like to my uh, live journal community, like my first thing is like, I when being asexual meant that I felt like I was a space alien. I'm like, okay, that's, that's just undiagnosed autism discussion there. Um, but I really do think it's just like, it's, it's more like we recognize that something is different, something doesn't fit. And rather than just going like, uh, well, I'll just do what I'm supposed to do and so on. I think autistic people are probably more likely to, to like say, no, I'm different. And I don't want to pretend that I'm not because I'm already pretending to be normal all the time and it's really exhausting. So this yeah. is one more thing. It's that, interesting. Maybe autistic, maybe autistic people are more likely to think outside the box and examine, you know, why they seem sexually different than other people. Or, or maybe there is a neurobiological correlate. It's fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just like what you said about kind of more likely to like acknowledge it openly. 
Because I feel like statistically, autistic people are more likely to identify as being some kind of queer in general rather than just specifically asexual, I've heard. So it might just have something more to do with looking, being more inclined to look into it and then being more inclined not to hide it as Maybe, opposed yeah. to actually being more likely to be like that, possibly. <laughs> Certainly when it comes to people that don't feel strongly gendered, if you're... As a as a complete generalization, like uh, people who are non autistic are probably just going to go, okay, well, I I don't really get it, but uh, but I'm just going to go along with the mainstream. Maybe. Whereas, maybe, yeah. In autistic communities, there's a hell of a lot of people talking about. Well, I don't feel that any strong inherent identification with gender, therefore, I'm willing to say or re willing to explore this. And I, I think that's possibly the difference. Somebody I should also also say there are loads of people who are allosexual who are ace who are autistic. Oh no, like, definitely. And somebody, somebody, I saw a couple of comments saying maybe it has to do with the sensory um, issues associated with the, the autistic spectrum, and I can definitely vouch for that. Like you know, sticky, slimy things are absolutely disgusting, whether it be a toy, a, a, you know, children's slime, or. or or whether it be sex, <laughs> like it's just you, you know. <laughs> and, but yeah, e I know. Equally, there are autistic people who sensory seek and really love that aspect of sexual oh, activity. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, there's other so things on, that so, I would... and kink. We, we, yeah, we are totally. like there may be another tend to be at extremes. That. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm just gonna bring it back onto the um, one of the points here. We have like two more slides, and I'm aware we've already been on here for two hours, so we're kind of reaching the end of our session. Um, but there was an interesting point made by David J back in June 2002, which is my birthday month. So I would have been a happy six-year-old when this was written, um, talking about um, how asexual people might not be so inclined towards the classic definitions of femininity or masculinity. Is um, David J said, or maybe I should let, do you want to read this one? I, I don't see the slide. I think I'm oh, yeah, sorry. Can we move the slides down? I'm not in control of the slides to 51. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you want to read some of that one out? Uh, or I could do it. Just um, I, I'll read it. I, I think I, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna feel cringy about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, the the well, I won't read it exactly. The the idea I was trying to explore here, which um, I don't think I'd agree with now is that, well, I, I think what I was trying to explore is that part of the enforcement of gender is like sexual shame is used to enforce a gender binary that we're told that if we don't gender perform in a particular way, then um, we will be punished with a lack of sexuality and therefore a lack of intimacy and therefore a lack of connection with other people. Like the, the cost of not being, not, uh, performing gender in the right way is uh, is being alone, and I was trying I was trying to explore that idea, and I think was still wrapping my head around all the ways that um, gender performance can be this like beautiful, exciting thing, and someone may want to be really super femme, um, not because they're afraid that if they're not super femme, they'll be alone, but because they like being super femme, <laughs> and. Uh, and so I think I was I was trying to explore how um, the that mechanism of enforcing gender identity applied less powerfully to these folks. Right. I think there was a lot in the early. I think especially in early, like people would make like a personal website, kind of just like I'm explaining what asexuality is. And a lot of those early websites were very much like here are here is my theory of why I'm like this, but I'm gonna write this in an extremely generalized way that, that says all asexuals are gonna be like this thing that I've worked out about myself. And then when we came together as a community, we're all like, oh, okay, no, I've met some of the people now and it's not right. But early on, like a lot of like January, 2002, I think this is still kind of in the era where we were kind of like going, here is what I f theorize other asexual uh, other asexuals would be like based on what I'm like. I, I don't know. Do you, do you disagree? Oh, someone just in the comment mentioned the official asexual society, which I think of as I mean, there's ways that 
Haven was exactly that for me. Me projecting my own experience, and that I think other sites were. But the official asexual society was was an example of when I referred earlier to a site that like had a quiz you had to fill out. Um, that was one that was very much a, a individual's definition that they were trying to enforce. Um, if anyone can find a copy of that site, I think it would be great to have. I haven't been able to find it in the Wayback Machine, but it'd be great to have for for historical purposes. Yeah, I mean, it's all, it's something that I kind of, I mean, I've encountered quite a few people who have noticed that for obviously quite a lot of members of the ACE community who identify as non-binary or agender or gender queer or gender fluid. And I always kind of wondered if it's something to do with, um, you know, there's a quote by, I, I want to say Simone de, de Beauvoir, but I'm not sure if it actually was Simone de Beauvoir, but saying something along the lines of that, like, particularly in terms of masculinity, that um, men are kind of defined, more masculinity is defined by the difference from women and the attraction to women and kind of like suggesting how um, your kind of sexual orientation is kind of tied to your expression of masculinity or femininity, um, which nowadays is obviously challenged a lot more, but I kind of wondered if maybe there was a kind of correlation between if you don't feel that kind of sexual attraction, then maybe you will be kind of less worried about ticking like traditional feminine or masculine boxes. And that's kind of the vibe I got from the statement that you posted, um, David J. That's kind of what I thought you might have been going for was something more akin to that kind of idea, mm. just based on like the last few lines, maybe. Uh, yeah, I think that, I think that th this idea that we are um, that we can still, you know, as ACEs, we're still expressing gender, but where it's there's less enforcement, or we were less less targeted. Yeah, but there's many ways that we still are. I would my my two cents on that are like um, since I was trying to attract a partner romantically but not sexually. I would dress in ways that would accent my whatever that would accent my waist or something or I, I would dress I would wear girly clothes and I'd wear makeup but I never showed cleavage I never did so it was like I dressed the way the women dressed in the 1950s movies when when they never showed any sex they would just kiss and that would be the end like I I honestly thought that those movies were how it really goes um, but I would dress to attract romantic attention um, but again yeah i would never you know wear something low cut or you know any anything sexual it and it didn't occur to me that the way i was dressing to attract romantic attract attention might also be attracting sexual attention um for what it's worth um so i tended to feel more feminine when i was on a date with a guy that i was feeling in love with um but i would try to look cute for him romantically like sensually but not sexually yeah, and I guess that is a distinction. And also, I guess some people do just have like whatever aesthetic they go for. Like people say my style is kind of veering in a sexy direction sometimes, but that isn't necessarily because I'm trying to attract anybody. I just like skimpy clothes sometimes. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but then there was a, a final post of this, which was by, um, well, it was by Matt. So you can, re you can read that one if you want to, since this is the, the last bit. Yep, happy to read it from behind the duck. Oh, uh, <laughs> from behind the duck. Sacrifice somebody. There we go. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I felt more secure behind the duck, but it's fine. No, I'm uh, so, uh, again, this is just me casting shade. Um, this, was after, this was at the same time as I was writing the FAQ, which I think was the only reason why I'd decided I needed to join. Um, but Basically, um, I'll read it out, then I'll apologize for it. Uh, I don't <laughs> consider myself to be gendered. I've been accused of having too much gender rather than no gender, but the categories don't mean anything to me. I guess I don't not identify as any gender, but I don't specifically identify as one either. I don't tell people what gender I am and they assume they know. And yes, I get people assuming I'm both of the binary options. I'm only bringing this up because the list description says it's for men and women. And I'm wondering if I'm being excluded. So um, yeah, basically, 
this is very defensive and not not great for being inclusive of other non-binary people really but it's it's uh from me being very used to being dismissed in many places and for people assuming that my experience was something different to what it was but uh, I, I absolutely do not think that you need to be androgynous to be non-binary every non-binary person or everyone in the everyone who doesn't feel that they fit into into the gender binary uh, is valid but this was 2002 and um, yeah that was just me kind of trying to show my androgynous cred at the time but uh, it, it is unfortunate that that haven wasn't more inclusive or wasn't a place that I felt was interesting or useful to join and have my discussions in because um, my perspectives that I was sharing elsewhere probably would have would have been helpful and maybe helped other people that were lurking but anyway I can say um, prior to you saying that this was this was meant as throwing shade I I, I took this at face value um, until like this this very moment of somebody being like hey are you intentionally excluding me as a genuine question to which the answer in my case would have been like oh I didn't know that this was a thing oh I'm so sorry yes you're included of course obviously this wasn't my community um but I, I do I like I don't know that's I find that I find that interesting and and again I guess I guess I'm just sad because we probably could have learned a whole lot from you because I had a lot to learn and no idea where to begin to learn it it's like you don't know what you don't know um and Obviously, I know your primary interest would be helping other people like you who were trying to find where they fit in. But even so, just sitting in the background and learning that other people with different experiences existed, I think would have been generally better for everybody to learn to be more inclusive. So, I mean, I was very, I was very active on the Live Journal community and on the Avon forums, which I think at one point we were running together when oh. DJ was on holiday. Or no, was uh, was in overseas doing something I, I, so I, like, I my memories at that time are very spotty as I've mentioned before I was coming out of a massively traumatic personal experience um and so a lot of the first half of, of uh 2002 is, is honestly lost to me like I didn't remember what I posted on the forums until I or on, on this until I I looked at it and I don't remember what I posted or how long I was on Avon um so but at the time that I was posting in like, you know, early June and because I think I'd left um, Haven by this point, I think I'd stopped responding. Um, but like, I, I don't know. There was a lot that I didn't I didn't know, didn't understand. Yeah, this was me coming back after getting involved with Haven forums and working on the FAQ and working on making everything really, really inclusive for a romantic people and kinky people and people who were sexually active or had non-directed libidos just trying to make it as inclusive as possible we were off doing that on Avon by this point and this is just me being there just kind of casting a bit of shade but this is not to say that it was um because basically again my talk that's on YouTube I think and the blog post kind of goes into this a lot more but I was really interested in kind of making a kind of queer sex positive kind of asexual space that was not judging or exclusive but I do think we did kind of overcorrect as a community mostly after I'd gone and kind of there was like no aromantic uh, section of Avon for a really long time like a really long time I don't know if there even is now because I'm not on active on Avon I'm sure there must be but um yeah I mean I'm demi-romantic and uh and I even now find it difficult to say that I'm asexual even though I wrote all that uh FAQ stuff but um because you know it's complicated but i'm you know i'm happy to say that i'm part of the asexual community and that i, d I identify as uh asexual and demi-romantic but it's it's there's a lot of gray area but anytime you go to like a community event and talk to other people almost everyone's in the gray area as well and that's what's important i think that we that we don't 
that we learn from the early community that we shouldn't have taboos and that we should talk about how you know we were in romantic relationships and not talking about it or that we were having sex with our partners and not talking about it all of that stuff or that we were you know autistic and not talking about it that kind of thing i think that's that's all really important um you know there's there's a whole load of stigmas that I think that we have moved past. Um, and uh, again, I, I'm sorry that we've come to an event about Haven for the Human Amoeba and I'm mostly just, this is why I didn't want to be a main guest because I was basically like, I thought that place is rubbish. But <laughs> it was really, it was really historically important. It was really useful for everyone, but I didn't really want to be part, a part of it for many reasons. And that's well why we made Haven. Well, I think that um, one thing that we can, I mean, uh, we've been talking for now two hours and 25 minutes, so we're going to have to wrap this one up. But I thought that was quite a good point to end on, not necessarily the, the in a kind of shady way, but in the sense that, you know, it's good to have different perspectives of like what was going on back then. And I think that one thing we can take from it is that the ACE community has definitely become a lot more inclusive while we're, we're not perfect and there is still exclusionism going on i think that we are generally a lot more sex positive and we're a lot more diverse and we're a lot more considerate of different types of experiences and the umbrella has expanded and aromanticism is included and i think that we've definitely come a long way in 20 years maybe not in terms of how many people outside of the community view us but at least on how we view each other which i think is potentially more important so i think that that's really good and i think it's been very interesting to hear about like the positives and the negatives from back then and how everyone has had such different experiences and i for one have found it to be a good learning experience as someone who in discovered avon when I, in like the 2010s and then didn't really engage that much with the ace social media spaces until like a few years ago so i kind of have a very like newer perspective on things. I didn't know that so many of these conversations were going on back then. So thank all of you for taking part in that and sharing your experiences. Um, and the last thing we had to say was about the creative anthology. So should I hand it over to you, Michael? Do you want to cover that part? We can't, I can't hear you very well. I me. think that you're no muted. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so apologies to David J for taking him off. Um, we have a limited number of people here. And um, yeah, just we're wrapping up now. And so this has been fascinating. Um, a, a, apologies for the technical hitches, the um, the unexplained interference at the start and the um, unexpected inter inter um, appearance of the duck, <laughs> which has become a thing. But yeah, we'd like to wrap up by a project that's, um, so one of our organizing committee for this event, Cha Cha Cha, um, had the idea to put together a, what, what they're calling an unnamed creative reflections project. So this is a, we're seeking um, creative reflections on passages from the archive. So if anything, either in the archives that we've seen today or um, or that you've heard from our guests has inspired you, then um, you're welcome to submit um, passages um, to um, cha 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 at gmail.com. There's more information here in this link. In fact, I'll, I'll put up this. This this link is also in the um, is also in the um, description for the video. Uh, see if I have it as a banner. Uh, no, I don't have it as a banner. Sorry, but it's it's in the it's in the um, description for the YouTube video. So um, please read more about that. And if you have any questions, um, the format is open to text, audio, art, um, video, personal essays prose, poetry, mixed media, or any other formats that you can display. So um, please do follow up on that if, if that's something, if, if anything in this has inspired you, then um, please um, please make contact and um, submit by 5th of December. Uh, yeah, so is, is that our last slide? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, the only other thing that um, we have, again, th thank you all for coming and for your comments. I'm sorry for people's comments that we didn't manage to get to, um, but th th it's all really fascinating reading this. So um, if you're not, we've overrun a bit from where we um, from where um, we planned. If you're not too all too exhausted, we're now hosting a um, meet on air meet. It's kind of like an after group discussion thing. So in the, um, yeah, we... I just put this put this on here. So this air meet link um, should you should also be able to find this in the description. Uh, 
So we're heading over there and um, you don't have to sign up. You just have to, it asks, what you have to do is you have to click on that. You might need to use a desktop or, or, and you might need to use, it says Chrome is preferred. I'm not sure if you actually have to need to use Chrome, but you might need to use a desktop or a laptop computer. Um, when you go there, you don't need to log in, but what you do need to do is you need to press enter air meet um, in the bottom left, in bottom right. I think that you can't do it yet because we haven't started it, but I will in a second. And when you do that, then um, you should. There should be lots of tables where you can um, sort of like sit down virtually and have discussions with each other. This is all very experimental, so apologies if, if this doesn't work. But um, I will go over there and I'll start off the air meet, and we'll leave this open just so that if, if people are asking questions about it, then you can um, we, we can we can sort of help you get set, set up. Also, just wanted to say thanks to all the organisers, to to uh, Yasmin and to Michael and to everyone behind the scenes who's been moderating and researching. This has been really valuable. Thank you for your hard work. Yeah. Thank you all for taking part. It's been awesome. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in and sharing your thoughts and all of your questions. And I guess we'll see you over on Airmeet, maybe. Yeah. No, and, no uh, I don't have to. I would also say that um, that was overly harsh to Haven. It was really important, but I'm also glad we outgrew it. <laughs> yes, know your history. That seems so like a really good sentiment to end on. Yeah. Like, Thank you. Know your history so that you don't repeat the mistakes of the past, right? So it's good to know what's going on back then, the good and the bad. So it's all helpful information. And yeah, I, I don't have control over ending this, so I will hand it over to Michael. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> Should we just disappear, or? <laughs> um, yeah. So um, this is this is the end of the official live stream. I'm, I've started off the Air Meet event, so hopefully you can go over there and um, to, to the link in the description. And um, like I say, if you go to the bottom right. Um, if, if, I don't know if any if anybody who's on the panels can try this, then that'll be useful. Um, just to make sure it's working okay. Then what you should do is you should we sh you should see a, load, a lot of tables. You might have to put in some details, like I think it asks you your name and your organisation. You can kind of just put none or put a nickname into your name and none for the organisation. Um, um, and then you should hopefully see a lot of several tables, and you can kind of click on one of them to sit down and have a chat. So. Right, okay, I'm just having to go onto the YouTube to get the link. And, okay, now I can see it. It was just posted in the private chat. Okay, great, okay, well, I found that. And I will pop over there and say hello. I can't promise I'll be there <laughs> for a while, but I can pop over and say hello. Um, so, yeah. Should we uh, sign off this one, or did you want to leave it open, or? Um, yes, I'll sign off in a minute. I just wanted to see if, um, just just wanted to stick around a bit in case people are having trouble getting into this. Okay, do we all have to stick around, Is the audience or? Still there? Do we still uh, have no. an audience? Should, should, we, yeah. should we go, <laughs> or? <laughs> I actually okay. think I have to run, so. Um... Uh, oh, okay, what? try. I went. To, I went to live stream um, now, and um, let's let let us all head over to Emmet. Uh, Lauren. Yes. Hey. I think I think I might have met you before. You look really familiar, and same with Yasmin. I feel like did you guys go to that 2013 um, uh, Pride Parade thing with David J? I've never been to Pride. <laughs> no, I definitely I was not doing much in 2013, so that wasn't um, me. <laughs> Okay, I, I, who knows? Anyway, Thank <laughs> and then I remember, I remember online. <laughs> Matt, I remember your username. I remember Paranoid Guy on Android because I thought it was cool. So I, I somehow knew of you guys before this group. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm kind of all over the internet. Yeah. So you've probably like seen me even stuff or post. Did you ever do anything? Stuff. Did you ever do anything with the okay. of Arizona? I'm, I'm any, any, sorry to interrupt. Okay. I'm going to live stream now. <laughs> Oh, okay. Bye. Okay, bye. bye. <laughs> <laughs>